Well, hey everybody, welcome to the stream. I still don't really have a significant electronics project to do my usual thing with, but it seemed like a good time to hang out and have a quiet chat stream and do some updates and talking and maybe playing with the cat if he wants. <coughs> So as usual, I'm streaming on YouTube, Twitch, and live.dio.zone. You can go to YouTube on the Scanlime in Progress channel, Scanlime in Progress, excuse me, or um, twitch.tv slash scanlime, or live.dio.zone slash scanlime. And there's a chat channel on YouTube and on Twitch, and we also have a uh, chat on Gitter.im, which a lot of us have been using too. Anyway, let's try. Let's try having a camera. You can join me out here on the uh, on the city balcony. <laughs> I think Tuco was just in here trying to bite my cables while I was setting up, but now he seems to be elsewhere, hopefully behaving himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm slightly sick. I don't think I have the new virus, but um, I've certainly been trying to avoid people anyway. Ah, <sighs> but yeah. So, like I said, I I don't have my usual um, thing to do right now, really, where I have like an active project that we go into depth on. Um, my project is still mostly just getting my set up here together, which is progressing for sure. It's still kind of stressful, but um, as you can see, it's like enough that I can use it, which is nice. Um, let's see. Yeah, other than just the general anxiety and everything falling apart in the world and trying to keep my mental health and physical health together, um, I feel like my biggest challenge with, with this project has been... Um, Figuring out what to focus on, like post move, as I've so for any of you who have been following me for a while, which is probably most of you, since I don't know why someone would just tune in right now. But hi, thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming back. Um, yeah, it. I mean, my usual thing has been, you know, I'm working on a project. Let's let's do that together and, and share that experience. Um, my project has been more and more, like, figuring out a bunch of just like personal and environmental unknowns and less like a specific technological thing that I'm trying to do. So I've got to figure out how to kind of like loop that back around into something that is worth sharing. Which I guess when I explain it that way, it sounds like my maybe what I should be doing is taking what I've personally been doing lately and turning that into a video. But like the other problem I've been having is I... It's like I need a limit on how meta I can get if I keep trying to describe the thing instead of just doing the thing that I never finish. So there's got to be a thing that I focus on, a, a thing that I am trying to communicate. And other things have to be in service of that, I feel. And that's been a big struggle lately. I mean, insofar as these first world problems go. Oh, yeah. But hey, how's everyone doing? How's your... um? How's your experience in 2020 so far? This dumpster fire of a year or whatever it's whatever it's like. Um, yeah, I mean, like, my 2020 has been all right, but just, like, the world at large has been pretty um, unstable lately, it certainly seems. And it's almost like I'm, I've been kind of, like, used to my life being unstable to an extent for the past several years. So, I mean, I don't know. It's, like, it's like weird because, like, in some ways, there are certainly, there's certainly the possibility that things get a lot more unstable. And, I mean, I, I guess things have already gotten a lot more unstable. But then it's also weird kind of watching the, like... I don't know. There's like this some there's this section of the population, right, that puts out tons of content out into the world and is also living what appears to be a fairly stable life. And that's probably not the majority of people. Like a lot of people seem to be living so 
relatively more unstable lives, but then like, you know, we all have this uh, image that we see constantly that's being produced by something that isn't like just one regular human. It's, you know, some kind of media machine that is sustained by vast resources. And so comparing your own like individual life to what's out there in the media, I, I guess it's going to be normal that things in the media always seem like, oh, we're just in our like bubble of, we've always had a stable place to live and a relatively stable job and all that. And, and then like out there in the real world, there's, that's like a lot less common. I don't know. It's just, I'm rambling, obviously. I don't know why I'm rambling, but yes, I'm alive. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I haven't been posting a ton on YouTube. Um, I mean, I, I feel like social media in general, um, I, I've been needing to rethink the way a lot of it works for me. Like, I've been annoyed at the platforms for a long time, right? And I've been experimenting with other platforms and trying to, uh, you know, figure out which problems are like, intrinsic to the platforms and which problems are me and which problem is just like humans. Um, certainly seems like, <laughs> like, like nobody was really prepared for just the vastness of all the humans connecting to each other in the ways that they have been over the past couple of decades. That's been pretty weird. But it's weird how like a lot of the things that were seen as individual behaviors, like putting some information out there, like, you know, it used to be you could like write a newsletter and send it to your friends. And the activity that you were doing was writing a newsletter and sending it to your friends. The activity wasn't like using my BIC or like Xeroxing or whatever. It's like, and now it's like, oh, everything's tweeting. Everything is about the medium rather than the activity that you're engaged in. And that's been pretty weird. Um, and so it's like, well, how, what can we do to escape that if we, if that's even possible? How necessary is that? Because I've been more interested in media lately than like projects. But that's the thing is like people like projects. A lot of people still watch like DIY project videos. I still watch that stuff sometimes. And so to the extent that we are media creators, it seems useful to understand the effects of media on humans. Yeah, that's a good point from from Twitch chat that a lot of folks are good at having a facade of stability. That's true. And like when you're in one of these, um, you know, just like big entities that are formed by like coalesced capital whims, like like all these big media networks, you know, there's vast pressure to maintain that facade of stability because the whole entity has to look stable. Otherwise, it spooks the stockholders and this wonderful system that we have falls apart because someone had a doubt and then the doubt got amplified. Yeah. yeah it's, been, it's been some weird times. I don't know. I'm, I was pretty disappointed that Bernie didn't do better, um, but I'm still rooting for him. And it's also just like interesting to, you know, it, it's like at this point, it's pretty obvious just like how dysfunctional a lot of the political machinery all over the world, but like, especially in the USA where I am, it's very obvious how dysfunctional of this is to everyone. I mean, and I feel like maybe we're at this precipice where at some point a critical mass of people are going to understand that we have to do things for ourselves to fix this. And we can't just like wait to submit our like, tiny little nudges to the politicians who are just going to mostly ignore us anyway. <sighs> but I don't know. So it's like, it's this weird time for me personally where the world feels like it's at the edge of a lot of changes and there's all this kind of possibility for change for better and for worse in the air. And it's just kind of hard to do anything useful alone. So it's like, I've been trying to figure out who to, team up with at this point. Um, like, what am I doing? Who am I doing it with? I mean, obviously there's Tuco, but like, I can't really, I can't really do art or politics with Tuco, mostly just cuddling and fetching bolts. Um, and so I, I feel like a big step 
for that personally, was just like getting out of this extremely demotivating environment that I was in. So I had, I had an apartment that was, well, so this place you're seeing behind me, which I moved out of. So that's, that's a looping video from earlier, um, which I just thought was kind of relaxing. And there's no reason to be careful about its specific location at this point, now that I'm actually moved out. Um, yeah, I mean, that place was nice, right? I think a lot of us enjoyed the video from that era, but it was also super expensive. And when I moved in there, like it had to be temporary there. I did not have a plan for paying like their 3,200 a month rent in perpetuity, you know, for a while it seemed like I could do some mix of like teaching and contract jobs and artwork and whatever. And it was just never enough. And my savings from the Silicon Valley jobs were not going to last forever. And so I needed a way to actually stop throwing my money into the landlord pit and for a while, it seemed like I could team up with folks in the Bay Area and do something that was worthwhile, and also I would figure out how to pay the rent. But all of those social relationships just imploded. I mean, and a lot of that was my fault, because I'm just a terrible human being in a lot of ways. Like, I never learned how to be a stable or good person, and it's, like, hard for me to keep that up with people. And so, like, yeah, I mean, there's this combination of I didn't know how to be a human really and then the people that I found that would put up with me were also not great and so I didn't really learn how to be a good human from them and so I end up with this combination of like people who don't really stick around and people who are like actually really toxic and I kind of stuck that out as long as I could because it seemed like the Bay Area was still the natural place for me it was like all I knew was technology, and that was where the technology coalesces. But, yeah, it was just, I, I just couldn't fight the depression from that anymore. It just seemed like I was being like sucked into this whirlpool of awfulness, and there was nothing I could do to get out. Um, but, like, I had resources to get out. I just didn't know what to do, so it kind of took, um, you know, just feeling really burned out about all of that last year and having my roommate move out, which made the rent worse. And then feeling just especially aimless about my project work and not having any clients that I liked and just all of that, um, kind of, you know, put the fire to my feet to actually move out of the Bay area. So here I am moved slightly out of the Bay area, which has been nice but also a lot of work and um, the work has not been overwhelming necessarily, but it's been one of those things where I, I need to find a good source of motivation to counter all the things that have been difficult. And the, the, um, the social aspect of it is really tricky for me right now. Like I, I kind of need the support of people on the internet to some extent, like it's always been a lifeline to me, but it's not as simple as it used to be. And I don't really know how to go about it in a way that feels healthy. Um, like, like, when I was much younger, the internet was a relatively uncomplicated social lifeline. Like, I could find communities that were centered around kind of projecty interests. Like, I could go, I could go hang out in a IRC chat room and talk about Linux, or you know, start a project chat room or something, and. It seemed relatively good and relatively uncomplicated, but like with the benefit of hindsight, like that was just because I was ignoring so much of the world. Like I was a high school student without a lot of like constraints of my own. And um, I certainly didn't know it at the time, but I was like really, really socially isolated then. And also had a really dysfunctional family that I also just had no idea level of dysfunctionality at that point so um it was just i don't know it felt like an an easy decision like you know the rest of the world i kind of have no com no hope of like figuring out how to navigate that with with no um like no mentorship and no like emotional guidance or like stability so 
you know, it felt like when, when that's the alternative, like, oh, hanging out and writing source code for like whatever bullshit project you think is the most important thing ever, like that, that feels like an unalloyed good at that point. Like you can, nothing bad can, can come of that. But like in hindsight, that was pretty bad. Like I, you know, it was just this way of like, on one hand, like building a little isolated bubble around myself, which was kind of protective for a while and certainly like helped me um, figure out the transition stuff in a maybe a better way than I would have otherwise. It was like, I, I, I should have known I was trans when I was like 15. And then I kind of went through this whole process of like delaying it, delaying transition for like another decade. Um, and a lot of that, with again the benefit of a lot of hindsight like that really lined up with the kind of deepest um you know kind of like project tunnels that I would go into like I would I would get really isolated I would just like um like really turn away all human interaction. Like I wouldn't let anyone talk to me and I just wanted to work on this project like until it was done basically, until either I passed out from exhaustion or I reached a satisfying enough stopping point or whatever. Um, and like in hindsight, that was super unhealthy and it meant that I could sort of take the non-existent relationships I had with a bunch of friends and the dysfunctional relationship I had with my family and the really unsatisfying and um, incompetent educational system I was in and just like crystallize all of that. Like none of it had to matter. I could just step out of all of it because the thing that we're doing now is writing software, not any of the other things. And so I don't know, like, I don't know what things would have been like if I took a different path, but that's how things went. And it means that the conditions under which I got used to that being a good kind of social baseline where, oh, you can just hang out in an IRC and write software together. Those are just very different conditions than exist now, either in my life or in the world at large. <clears throat> Tuco came back. And I don't know if, I don't know if he came, I don't know if he actually bumped the camera, but he walked over to that speaker. I need to try to catch up on chat a little bit here, sorry. <laughs> Tuco is going to destroy all of the window blinds in my house. <laughs> oh yeah, so there's some nostalgia in chat for like the old internet, internet 1.0 or like the AOL days or whatever. I mean, I get that sentiment. I, I feel that too, but I also have to, um, I have to kind of mix that in with some, um, like a little, a little dose of realization that it wasn't just the internet that was cha that changed. It was also my point of view that changed a lot. Um, you know, the the simpler internet, right? Where it's just like, oh, you just hang out on like slash dot and like make fun of people who use Windows or whatever. Like, I mean, it was I think a lot less harmful than today's like alt right trolls. But I think it was that same kind of thing where you have really dysfunctional interactions with society at large and then you kind of find this cool little community online that's you know relatively safe and relatively friendly um and i, I mean i i think i found something that wasn't too bad it's just like oh we just like i mean i think the problems with with that kind of open source community became pretty apparent when we realized just like, oh, the diversity is terrible because we're taking these like clicks of white tech bro guys and like just giving them tons of money and not making them do any real work, like and not making them like step outside their comfort zone and like didn't realize that was a problem for a long time. Um, you know, just doing, doing tons of, um, kind of like optimistic reaching for things that seemed like they could be um yeah I feel like I don't know I don't know how widespread this is but I, at least I feel like personally a lot of what I was doing was like optimistically reaching for this idea that if we worked really hard at this one particular thing that seems really useful 
it can just make everything so much more awesome. So we've just got to do that and nothing else matters. And it's, it's this way of like focusing on um, something that seems good, but you know, like the way that you're doing it kind of negates the goodness or the badness of what you're doing. Like the thing itself kind of ceases to matter if you are pursuing it so single-mindedly that you don't allow for like humanity to exist around you. Um, you know, so it's like, like a lot of the shit that we're dealing with now, you know, came from a bunch of bored college students who thought it would be cool to make a website that was like hot or not. And you know, rating how attractive women are. And it's like, you know, at the very micro scale, it's like, okay, these kids are just having a little like click of, you know, boys will be boys or whatever. But it's like you zoom out even a tiny bit and it's just, it's terrible. And then you, you play that forward and you get 2020. Um, so I don't know, that just has me really frustrated with the whole like, um, You know, it's like that. It's like the social environment that allowed, at least me and probably some of you, to, to just kind of play and use technology to just kind of make this little Lego world that you can you can kind of hope for. Like, I mean, like that was like a social safety net for a lot of us. But at like such a macro scale, I feel like that's also a lot of what's, um, you know, I think I think a lot of it is really people not taking um, not taking care to view. Um, <laughs> that's Tuco in the litter box. I don't know if that's even coming through the headset mic. I guess I'm trying to say that the the things that we did to build the world that we're in, I think a lot of them were done with a blindness to the power dynamics that we were actually in. You know, like, at least, like, personally, I'll certainly say that I had no idea, like, I, I tried to just ignore, like, politics, and I didn't really think about, um, you know, what motivated people at a large scale and a small scale. I just wanted to think about, you know, the concrete ones and zeros, and I thought at the time that it was ethical to ignore the things that weren't concrete. But that process of just narrowing your vision down to only the things that you understand, like that itself is a form of violence. Like it's taking the possibility that something else exists and excluding it, which inevitably hurts people. And I didn't understand that when I was younger. And I think a lot of people still don't understand how powerful, like, I don't know, like that decision about how to shape the future, you know, it's like we don't really take that seriously. We have so much faith in, you know, letting money decide around here. Like, oh, whatever the dollars want to do is going to be best. We'll just let the free market figure out what the future should look like. You know, and it's not like individuals should be taking that role either, but it seems like we've kind of forgotten the idea that democracy is people making decisions together for a mutual benefit. Tuco's wandering around and making me nervous. <laughs> hmm. How is everybody else's experience? So I, as I said, I've, I'm kind of near the Bay Area. I, I just heard that the Bay Area itself kind of went into official shelter in place, which we aren't quite there here, but it seems like that might be coming. Oh yeah, uh, one person said that uh, on Reddit, r slash Linux is dumpster fire. And then <laughs> someone else is like, yeah, that's why I created my own tech group, which I get that too. I mean, that's kind of what led me here. It's like, well, let's, let's make our own thing. I just, I feel like I also just haven't come to terms with the underlying problems enough to not just repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And it's like, is tech itself the problem? Like the way that we think about tech, the way we interact about tech...
Oh, we got some good conspiracy theories here in YouTube, gosh. Oh, and someone who'd rather be working home, but their, their employer isn't allowing it. Yeah, that's... I mean, there are so many just, like, basic needs that we have, like being able to telework, being able to get reliable food and housing and medication and, you know, access to medical care, both emergency and preventative, that are just basic things that we all need, which, you know, now, of course, the crisis is exacerbating. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically showing well-off people that they might have to deal with the same problems that poor people deal with constantly, and that's freaking out the well-off people. And then, of course, poor people, disabled people, all have a much harder time dealing with the disruptions that are going on right now than people who are healthy and rich. <laughs> a mix of light and heavy content. Yeah, gosh. That's, that's pretty real, right? <laughs> yeah, we got some good conspiracy theories here. That's cool. <laughs> One opinion that internet in the 90s was terrible and then somehow humanity made it even worse. <laughs> I mean, that's one opinion, sure. Um, I don't know, I feel like the internet is pretty much... I mean... I guess it's hard to argue that the internet now is worse than it was then. It's a lot faster, right? Like, I have a lot more bandwidth. That's interesting, right? I think I had that door closed and then Tuco knocked it open a little bit. So like, gosh, I was on a modem for most of the 90s. Like, when did we get DSL? I should really have water here, but I only have beer, so we might have to do that. <laughs> Yeah, modems, um, yeah, there's a lot of bandwidth here, and there's a lot on the internet, but it certainly seems worse. How did we end up with that? Right, and it's like, and you can't just turn the clock back by making a second internet using 90s technology, because everyone has different expectations. Like, you know, we, we try that kind of thing every so often. Like, I mean, Siftio was kind of like that. It's like, you know, you can't you can't build a project that isn't pushing the envelope with technology in the way that the consumers expect and still have anyone give a shit. And that's just really depressing. And like, that's what I think, I think people were pretty keenly aware of that, like in the nineties and two thousands when it came to like software requiring ever increasing system specifications. And it's like, Oh, why are we doing this? This old software was better or whatever. And it's like, I mean, that's not entirely real. Like the old software, a lot of times had some severe limitations, especially when it comes to localization like a lot of this was kind of like, oh, make, you know, make things like they used to be like, you know, because they used to be good. Like it wasn't actually good for everyone, like just because it was good for you. So there's some of that going on, right? Like the section of the population that would have had access to computers that spoke their language and were affordable in the 90s was just tiny, tiny, tiny compared to now. Like the only reason I had access to a computer in the 90s is my dad brought one home from his job making, you know, missile parts or whatever. So, <sighs> yeah. Yeah, that was funny. Actually, the first internet access I had was, was through a Lockheed Martin VPN, because my dad brought that home from work. Um, I think, he, you know, he, he tries to be conscientious for a Lockheed Martin employee, but he still works for Lockheed Martin. So, you know, there's that. So he, you know, he'd bring home like the security card and you know, you'd have to like type in the code off of it and you know, dial in with the 14.4 modem. And then you could, you know, I don't know what exactly he used it for. I think he was like copying wind modeling files back and forth. I, my understanding is that very little of what he actually did was classified. But, um, but then, you know, once I started being interested in it, like he thought it would be better for us to get like AOL or something. So I think we were on AOL for a while. 
Uh, and then AOL was interesting. I didn't really get that into the social groups in AOL, though. Like, I was kind of scared away by chat groups. Because I think... I don't know why I didn't get into chat rooms earlier. I think I had just heard some, like, propaganda that, like, oh, everyone on the internet is, is like, untrustworthy and terrible. Which is, like, mostly true, but also not really the extent of the advice that you give. It's, like... It would have been useful, actually, for me to get a better, like, early lesson in how to interact with people without necessarily trusting them. That would have been useful. <laughs> but instead, I mostly just, like, stayed away from AOL chat rooms and didn't really get into chat until, like... I mean, I did, like, mailing list kind of stuff for a little while, but it was mostly IRC, like, on Freenode. I forget what project I started. Um... Like, there, there were some projects that I think I hung out in before, like, starting my own chat room, but then most of my early internet socialization was this chat room that I started for this. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I'm trying not to keep this too nonlinear, but I mentioned that there, there was this um, feeling I had that, you know, if you just came up with the right project and just, like, really, really did it and put all your energy into it, then it would just make the future better somehow and, and you'd be great and everyone would like you or whatever. And and so my, my vague aspirations in that direction were focused into this project that I called Pico GUI, like a tiny graphical user interface. And I, I had all these crazy ideas about it. Like I wanted it to be I mean in with all the hindsight we have now, it's it was kind of pointed in a similar direction as today's like JavaScript based client side computing and all that. But it was designed for a much, much more constrained environment, and it was really driven a little more by technical constraints, whereas obviously today we aren't, you know, JavaScript and CSS everywhere, and like browsers inside of browsers inside of browsers, and who even cares how much RAM you need. And, but like at the time, I was actually trying to make, um, I was trying to make a really affordable computer that I could build for like people like me and my high school classmates. And so I wanted a graphical user interface that required very little RAM, and you could run it on these little MMU-less processors that could run this restricted version of Linux. And so there were all these weird technical constraints I was trying to hit. And so I wanted something that... Um, anyway, I don't need to go totally into the technical weeds, because I could, I could talk about my strange architectural ideas for that all day, but I got really into this thing, like, way more than I think I really should have been. Um, it was kind of a weird path to go down because I think that did eventually lead me toward getting the Silicon Valley job that kept me occupied for a while and let me um, like pay for a lot of my like expenses like housing. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how I'd be paying for housing right now probably by working a job that I hate um, rather than like trying to make internet videos. Um, and so, like, that was pretty weird. Like, I, I got super obsessed with this project to the point where I, like, that was what I was doing instead of, like, going to my college finals and going to classes. I was just working on that project, and I started this kind of online community around it that was this chat room on Freenode. And, you know, there were, there were a few people in there that were really interested in the GUI, but I think a lot of it turned into a social channel. Like, it kind of morphed from you know, like people who were actively interested in helping on the project to people who were trying to just like run it or interested in like kind of tangentially related stuff. And, you know, a couple of friends from high school and uh, people I, I mean, I actually met some friends that I, I stuck with for quite a while in that group. I mean, that was how I met the person who um, was really like my only contact in California when I moved out to California. And he and I didn't really stay friends. Like, as soon as I met him in person, it was kind of clear that we weren't actually going to be that close. And then we we had, like, a pretty big falling out later. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of the road from obsessed over project to moving out to California, just, like, keeping that social isolation constant all the way through. Uh, Oh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, Brutus from chat says that they, they can't say uh, uh, they can't say exactly where it was going to go, but they've always been worried about um, kind of in the old internet days. There's this idea that, oh, internet is different from real life. Um, 
people would treat online as like not real or like different from the rest of reality. And yeah, that, that hits me pretty strong. I feel like from the beginning, like the internet was very real to me and it, like I was, I was meeting people that I first met online in person, like way before that seemed like a normal thing to do and kind of coming to terms with that. That was pretty interesting. Hey, to go. Do you want me to hold you? Do you want to play? Let's see if Tuco will let me hold him. Sorry, this chair is so creaky. I really need to get some new furniture for this recording room. I I was mostly using these terrible plastic folding tables um, at my old place, and I sold all of those um, rather than moving them. So I have a more minimal set of furniture now. I've got this height adjustable desk, which is pretty great as an editing desk, but not really great for filming. I need something pretty much rock sturdy and quiet. Oh gosh, I have to say my relationship with Tuco has been really good since moving here. Like I wasn't sure how Tuco would take the new place, but I was having some trouble coexisting with him at the old place and you know, he certainly gets into terrible moods now, and it's not always 100% easy, but it's so much better here. I think he and I both appreciate the warmth and having a little bit more of a variety in space. Um, Tuco really also likes the outdoor area. I've got a little backyard, um, and there's a tree. The tree isn't actually in my backyard. It's It's like in the neighboring lot, but we have a good view of it, and there's a lot of birds and squirrels. Tuco and I both like watching them a lot. Oh, that's the heater. I should remember to turn off the furnace before I record. <laughs> oh, he's so chill. We haven't been doing as much fetching bolts here. We have some. I'm still kind of trying to figure out where his favorite spots are. I think he's not really sure where to return the bolts. Like, we need to establish where his home base is for that. But he does play with them, just not as much as at the old place. He's been doing a lot of running and a lot of watching birds. I've got this running wheel for him. There's a If you go to diode.zone, there's some videos of Tuco running on the wheel. Um, yeah, he still uses that thing a lot. Like most days he wants to take a couple of extended running sessions on there where like he and I are both pushing. Cause he can run on it on his own, but he likes it when I push the wheel so that it goes even faster. So usually I'll grab the wheel from the top and kind of throw it down and grab the wheel from the top and throw it down over and over again with my arms and kind of get a severe tricep workout while Tuco runs. And it's pretty great. Oh, and I woke up next to Tuco this morning and it was so good. He's like, I don't know, Tuco's got a couple of different spots he sleeps in. I've got this heated pad for him, um, kind of near the door of my bedroom. But he also likes to sleep on the bed a lot. <laughs> so last night, I I was going to bed kind of late because I was up late watching a movie. And he um, he was sitting on top of all the covers. And I'm realizing now that I have a cat... Like maybe I should actually make my bed because I never make my bed. I've never been able to do that. It was, it was one of the things in the category of things that don't seem important that my mom always yells at me about. So I always have trouble doing it. Like it just has bad associations at this point. So, you know, whatever, I'll just like layer the sheets however I want as I'm getting into bed usually, but I can't do that when Tuco's already on top of them. So I'm, I'm there like kind of sliding un under the blankets as much as I can without disturbing Tuco at all. <laughs> kind of cold, but, you know, enjoying being next to him and enjoying not disturbing him. And so that lasted a little while. I think eventually he got up and, and I straightened out the blankets and I went to bed and I assumed he was going to sleep elsewhere. But then I woke up in the morning and he was right next to my pillow, like sleeping with his back right against the side of my head. And he does that sometimes and it's one of my favorite things to wake up to. Hmm. Oh, the warm heat is actually kind of nice. It's like blowing right over here. And I think Tuco's into it also. Yeah, it's pretty nice living in a place with heat. 
the old the old place didn't really have heat like it it had these two heaters um like two separate gas heaters that you could turn on and off and one of them had a thermostat but the thermostat was like right next to the heater so it didn't actually measure the temperature of anything useful um and that one also had trouble keeping its pilot light lit and then the other heater didn't have a thermostat it just had an on off switch and it was really loud so this is a big improvement and it's been rainy here. I just did some yard work like earlier this week, trimming the grass. And now that it's been rainy the last couple of days, looks like the grass is already kind of expanding a little bit. The yard here is very patchy. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it, but it seems like there's some amount of grass and some amount of like clover or whatever. And I got some raised um, garden beds that I want to set up. I don't know exactly what I'm going to plant. I need to figure out what I what I can grow here. But it seems like doing some gardening would be really nice since we actually have some outdoor space and we could even see the garden from the bedroom window, which seems super cozy. I am now regretting not having the chat in front of me, but I can't move or this cat might become less comfortable, so I've got to stay exactly where I am to maximize the comfort of this cat, which is really the goal in life. Yeah, so I need to find some good high-level goals that make sense. I mean, my high-level goal really is to stay alive and to keep my cat alive and to keep trying to make content that is useful in some way and that my patrons want to support and that I can get people excited about in at least some way and that might actually, like help people deal or help some cause I care about or just help people learn about something that I can teach. Um, you know, like the last year or so, I feel like my motivation for like tech stuff has just been at an all time low. But I think a lot of that, I mean, a lot of it is just like the world getting more complicated and tech seeming less relevant, but you know, I'm hoping that I can at least figure out how to come up with a good match between like what I can do and what I would like to be able to do for the world or for the people around me or something. Like that's the other thing is like I don't I don't know who to focus on like interacting with or helping or providing a service to like who are my peeps? Like, that's, I guess that's the really top-level question for me. Like, who are my people? Like, are you my people? I don't know. <laughs> I think you might be my people. Are you, do you want to be my people? Um, and, I mean, assuming a lot of you are my people, why are you here? And uh, how can I make things cool for you? And, you know, like, those are the kinds of things that I need to figure out. And... And I don't know, like this all interacts pretty badly with my social anxiety and with how I've been using technology as more of a substitute for humanity than an adjunct to it. But gotta gotta hit that nail head on at this point. Now that I have some housing and sort of a studio, that's really the question. It's like, what are we doing here? I mean, making things comfortable for cats is pretty good. I can do other things too, though. Oh, Tuco is... Oh. He feels like he's in a really good mood. Oh, now it's almost too warm. I guess like one big project in my life lately has just been um, like the house itself, like fixing stuff, rewiring stuff. I haven't actually started rewiring the house. That's going to be a big project. I'm still kind of in the planning phase for that. Um, I did map out which circuit breaker all of the outlets and appliances are on. So I have a much better idea of just like what 
all the different circuits are used for and like what things are wired in common and what things are probably newer versus older. Um, and in that process, I did, um, I did find a couple of circuits that seemed really better than average. So there's one circuit in this room, actually, which seems to be like the best one in the house. It seems like it was installed pretty recently. And it's just like one outlet that goes directly to a dedicated circuit in the panel. It's back here in the room that I want to keep quiet, though. So I have a long extension cord taking that to the front of the house where I have the equipment racks. And that's running um, not all the equipment, but like about half of it. Um, and then I have a different circuit, which is seems also pretty good. Seems newer. It's not just like one outlet, but it's like a few outlets in the front of the house. Got a shorter extension cord running another rack off of that. I don't like any of that. Like, I don't like running power over extension cords, both because I have to, like, Tuco eats that kind of stuff. Like, I've every time Tuco has access to that part of the house, I have to worry about Tuco chomping on the cords. Um, like, there are plenty of other cables around that Tuco likes more than those right now, which is good. But yeah, I have to keep vigilant, vigilant about that. Um, so I need to at least run some less temporary power for the stuff that I'm actively using. But then I also, I think I just need to rewire basically the whole house. Like a lot of the wiring is really old. Um, so I, I wanna see if that is for sure what I need to do or if there's something smaller I can do. And then I need to see like, what can I do myself? What do I need permits for? What do I definitely need a professional for? And just figure all that out. And I've, I've got some of some idea for that, but I need to like actually read the rest of the electrical codes. And, and I was having this problem where I'm like, oh, I found the electrical codes. Normally you have to buy them and they're expensive. I did find, um, I mean, but they're, they're like laws though, right? Like you shouldn't have to pay for a copy of the law and you don't, you, it's just people often make you pay for convenience, but somebody scanned them and put them on archive.org. So I was viewing, I was viewing them there, but they're also giant scanned PDFs, like non-searchable scanned PDFs. So that's not great either, but I was having especially a hard time viewing them because um, they were just, they were just too big for my laptop. My laptop was running out of memory or something, or it just couldn't handle rendering the pages at a high enough resolution in a reasonable time. So I needed to set up my, um, my beefy workstation just to read the electrical electrical codes. And now I've got the beefy workstation set up and it's, I guess I could give you a tour of this room once I'm not holding the cat, but this is really important that I hold him and he's very comfortable. Oh, that's the heater turning off. Hmm. Gotta learn all these little things to keep Tuco as comfortable as possible. Like, like I can't let my hair get in his ears because he's ticklish and it doesn't feel good. And you know, if I'm if I'm holding him, I don't want to like breathe toward his face because that rustles his whiskers and that's also uncomfortable. And you know, learn what positions he likes to be held in and that kind of thing. A lot of cats don't like having their paws touched, but it seems like Tuco likes having his hands rubbed when I'm holding him like this, which is also kind of interesting. <laughs> Good cat. <sighs> uh, I do need to figure out how to deal with all the anxiety here, though. Like I had a therapist that I would see every couple of weeks before I moved, but um, I had to I had to break up with them. <laughs> I mean, I could go back and see them, but I mean, they were also expensive. Like, I want to see if I can find a therapist that my insurance works with. Oh, the heater's turning back on already. Hmm. Gosh, the healthcare system in this country is just so bad. And it's like, I feel like if it, like, like we're, we're in this position where it's just so easy to not notice how bad it is if you are employed with a stable 
like full-time job that provides good benefits, it's just easy to forget that the the other options, like, I mean, before we had, um, so I live in California, and even before um, the Affordable Care Act or, you know, Obamacare got passed, we had something similar in California called Covered California, which is, like, I think it's, like, still the system that you go through. Um, and it's, like, I'm very grateful that it exists because I did experience not being able to get health care for years, like, after I quit the last full-time job that I had that provided benefits. Um, I... Uh, I mean, so when you when you leave, they give you the option to extend your health care by paying for it out of pocket with this program called COBRA. And that's usually really expensive. Like, I think they were going to charge me something like $800 a month. So um, I tried to... And, and it's also for a limited time. It's like you have the option to use it right away, and and then you have to pay for it continuously. and And then if you stop or switch to a different plan or whatever, like, you can't go back on it. It's just, like, this one-time, like, continuation. So I didn't do that. I tried to get insurance on the open market because everyone loves free markets. Um, and I think I tried three different times, and I always got turned down for bullshit reasons. Um, and, like, they, it's so it's so bad. Like, they don't even tell you why they turned you down. You have to send a separate letter to, like, request an explanation and it's not like, it's not like, oh, here's, here's your new price because we don't want to insure you at our regular price or whatever. It's like, nope, try again. And, and maybe if you ask for a more expensive plan, they'll give that one to you, but you kind of just have to keep applying and they'll be like, nope, try again. So that sucked. So I was uninsured for a while. Um, and then after covered California, I got on that. And it's been good having insurance, but it's also really expensive and doesn't really provide a lot. Um, and it's just pretty easy to just not even not even know if you work at Google or whatever. I mean, and then, you know, like if you're unhoused, if you don't have stable employment, if you can't afford to buy the covered California, you know, $400 a month health care or whatever. Like there are also income assistance plans. So like, oh, you can buy the expensive health care with a bunch of paperwork that makes it less expensive. Like, why didn't they just give you a cheaper plan? Like, it's it's just ridiculous that there isn't a system where health care is a human right here. But, you know, a lot of the values that people like to talk about don't actually encode themselves into the laws here. Tuco's hands are so interesting. Most of you probably know Tuco is a polydactyl cat, right? And he's got extra fingers. I don't have an easy way of getting his hand on the screen right now. <laughs> oh, he is so relaxed. I shouldn't say they're extra. Like Tuco's got the right number of fingers for him, but he certainly has more of them than than most cats. Easier to pick up bolts, probably. Hmm. I should have glued together more of these to make a longer loop. I was just lazy and I picked a background that was already on my file server. I feel bad about ignoring chat, but this cat is so comfortable right now. Anyone else see the train go by back there? That's the train I used to live near that you would hear on the streams. No train here. There's, there's like a freeway outside, which kind of sounds more like a river, but it's more constant. It doesn't, doesn't just come and honk and then go for a while. 
Occasionally you have some variation in the noise when there's um, a big truck going by. Oh, you getting up too? Was wandering off. <laughs> yeah, Tico is pretty great. Gosh. I'm just catching up with Chad a little bit here. <laughs> Tuco is well, I was going to say he was rubbing his face on it but I think he's just sniffing at it he was sniffing at the um, night light in the hallway <laughs> gosh it makes me so nervous having Tuco walk around in this not fully cat proofed place so it'll certainly help my anxiety once I finish the cat proofing I've got all these um I've got all these big wire ducts now for the cabling between this room and the racks, which are at the other end of the house. Um and I mean not just for that, but also for distributing cable within the house. But uh I still need to actually finish my plan for like how I'm like specifically getting those into the rack, out of the rack. Um like it's pretty straightforward to get the ducting um between like this room and the area right next to the rack. Um, you know, I could take it through the floor in the closet or I could um, put like a little surface mount box over there in the corner and just have the ducting come up into that. But I like, I want to figure out something that's like a good mixture of serviceability and I slightly care about aesthetics, <laughs> you know. I'm trying to make sure I'm doing the right thing before I just start cutting holes in the hardwood floor, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, speaking of NAS, there's, um, there's a comment that, uh, from Mr. Radar that they enjoy sh me sharing knowledge and taking apart, or taking things apart and building kits and diagnosing firmwares and, um, yeah, and that reminds me, I do still have the the other Drobo that they sent. It's still in a box from a while ago when they sent me the Drobo, and like all the projects here that I am bad at getting to, I feel bad that I haven't gotten to it, but I do still have it, and it's still on the list. So we can do that once I have a bit more of the setup working here and a bit more of an idea of just how I want to structure this. Yeah, the healthcare here is pretty bad. And I've I've also tried um I've tried different kinds of healthcare. Like I've um I'm I'm on an HMO now, which is actually not the worst thing. Like HMOs are bad in a lot of ways, but the one that I'm on has pretty good trans healthcare at least. So like my main doctor that I get like hormones and just like everyday stuff through, like they're actually great. Um but then there's also a lot of other stuff that sucks and it's it's really hard to get mental health care because they just don't have enough service providers and it's also just a really overpriced plan so but then the last the last couple of insurance options that I had were um what was the other one PPOs and they I mean I tried what like uh I tried Blue Cross Blue Shield for a while which lets you choose a lot of different doctors but the main the main like doctors that I had access to were in like Sutter Health, which I just had bad experiences with. I, I still have a huge grudge against Sutter Health. Like they have advertisements for a bunch of stuff around here and I'm always cursing at them because I had some really bad experiences with them. <laughs> yeah, Tuco is pretty great. I, gosh, yeah. I mean, uh, we all know the real reason you're here, right? It's not because of the electronics, it's because of the cat. Oh, 
yeah having having a just like a a stable way to live with your cat can be tough sometimes because i mean you know this is what i like about cats though like cats are just they have so much personality and independence and uh, i mean a lot of dogs are like that too but i i feel like i kind of like vibe the same way with cats like i feel like i feel like tuco and i can kind of get each other in this way that um feels pretty special Yeah. Well, I could try taking stuff apart, but I don't really have a desk, which is limiting that somewhat. Um, let's see. I mean, I could show I could show you around the room a little bit, but that would break the illusion. I mean, the uh, being up here on the roof is so nice, isn't it? Got uh, got this view. If you want to really break the illusion, <laughs> this camera's a little nicer. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Am I? Um, Christopher asks, "Am I pretty into the political scene in the states, or is that something you want to keep off the channel?" Um, like the elections. I'm quite happy to talk about politics if other people are interested. Um, I mean, I my general feeling about politics is that it's not really possible to separate from most things. So when people ignore it, it just kind of ends up like rooting for the status quo. <laughs> the green curtain was a little traumatizing, sorry. <laughs> Station 240 is asking what projects I'm working on besides the house itself. Well, you want to, you just want everything, don't you? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just like building a race car from scratch and, you know, cutting the world in half. And I'm also turning Antarctica inside out. And I'm also relocating all the birds to their favorite places. So just those things. No, I, I'm, I'm mostly just getting myself set up at this point. Like, I mean, what did I do today? I did a bunch of like network setup to try to get the scanner working this morning so I could scan a bunch of tax documents. And then I organized the tax documents and then I met with an accountant and then I hung out with Tuco and set, set up more stuff for this. And I mean, I've mostly just been trying to keep my stuff together and make progress on the setup and not have Tuco eat all of the wires and destroy everything. So, um, I don't have an electronics project right now. I mean, I've been, I've been doing some other stuff. I've been trying to practice an instrument. I've been learning the automaton, which I think a lot of people probably think is kind of silly, but I like it. Um, yeah, that, that's cool. I, I'm, I'm sure other people have cool projects. <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah, maybe maybe I shouldn't show the green curtain next time. Maybe that was just tr too traumatic. If I'm going to do the green screen thing, I've got to commit to that entirely. <laughs> I figured some folks would see the little bit of green. Like I try to I try to adjust the filter, right? But there's a little bit of color spill. And especially I think if Oh no, that just goes transparent. There's a there's a green light back there too. So if I stick my arm into the green light, then my arm disappears. <laughs> Let's see, I've been cleaning the garage. I've been trying to figure out where all of the physical objects go. There are a lot of physical objects. Um, trying to figure out if I need additional shelving and just like where all the objects even go. And I need to refinish, um, well, I also need to put up these doors in the front of the house, part of the cat proofing project. And I need to 
do a bunch of just like woodworking on them, which is its own thing and like a whole thing I'm going to have to learn. But I also just need space for that. And so like some of my projects are like, I, I'm not, I'm not working on electronics today. I'm making some space in the garage because I don't have any square footage that is usable. Stuff, stuff like that. It's, it's not glamorous, but it needs to be done. Oh yeah, there's a question about whether this is the roof of the old place. Yes, that's exactly what it is. This was a time-lapse camera I had set up looking out the window there for a while. Yeah, so I guess any kind of tour of the equipment at this point involves breaking the illusion. <laughs> don't know if you can handle that. I also still don't have a great way of walking around with a camera. Um, oh, I had a I had a plan for that. I think we're going to do Wi-Fi for that. So I have a long SDI cable now. Um, so like the camera you're watching right now is actually on a 75-foot cable, so we could walk around with that. But I don't have a way to power it. Um, I I mean it wouldn't be that bad. It's just it's just like it's just more stuff. It's like oh I could. I could take the power supply off the camera and put the battery in the camera, which is not that bad. But then I also need power for the SDI converter. Right now it's got a power brick. I think I've got a cable that'll run that off of USB, so I need to find those. I think those are in the garage. They're probably in a stack of other very similar boxes that I still need to put in bins so that I can actually get to them. Um, so I need to find one of those and then find a power bank. And then, yeah, so like I can't do that like right now, but I, it's relatively easy. Um, I think the way I want to have like a walking around camera though is to use the Wi-Fi. So I did I did set up the Wi-Fi um, much better here. I guess that's a project. Um, I put in a set of Unify access points. So previously I just had this one D-Link access point, power over Ethernet, and my Wi-Fi setup is slightly complicated here because I want a bit of network isolation. Um, I want a uh, like a separate network for the Internet of Things, things, so that they can't talk to the Internet. <laughs> I, I guess that's, that they're not really Internet of Things if they're not on the Internet, but like, that's why it's a silly term, right? It's like, the Internet is not actually the part of the IoT I want. The the thing is the part that I want. It's just that the Wi-Fi is useful. So I have, I have like some Wi-Fi objects that are firewalled off from the Internet and they need a separate ESSID. I've got like a guest network and a main network, and then all of those are separate from the internal network. Um, and then I wanted to expand um, the single access point to multiple access points so I could cover the house a little better. But then one of the access points goes in the garage. So I, I guess TLDR, I've, I have been doing a bunch of like IT stuff, like just setting up network stuff. Um, so I wanted I wanted to set up in the garage where I'd have a little bit of computing, a little bit of networking, but then just like one cable going between the garage and the racks here. So I got that set up. Um, my plan is actually to run a one gigabit fiber in the same conduit as the power, which I've, I've got to go read the electrical code co closely to make sure I'm not going to piss off any inspectors by doing that. But my understanding is that I can get away with that because the, the, um, the fiber is rated non-conductive. So assuming I can get away with that, I can just pull a fiber through some existing conduit to get it into the garage. If I can't get away with that, I'll have to run a separate conduit. But um, yeah, my plan was to use uh, fiber just so that I could have that like isolation and be able to run it along with the AC without having to worry. Um, and then I've got a switch in the garage that breaks out a bunch of VLANs from um, that one trunk. And I have a few VLANs for Wi-Fi and some VLANs for cameras and some VLANs for shop stuff. So yeah, setting up all that was a bit of a thing. But it's nice, I've got, I mean, that was, that was actually a big complication factor in the move. Cause it wasn't just like, it wasn't just like box everything up, throw everything in a truck, move the truck, unpack it. I couldn't just do everything in one go because the servers and the cat both kind of needed their own separate trips. So it was like pack up most of the stuff, move most of the stuff, 
pack up all the oddly shaped stuff, move all that, and then pack up all the servers, move the servers, set up the servers. So that, that one day of downtime that I had for Diode Zone was I was waking up early, packing up the servers, getting a friend to drive me in their truck to the new place, and then spending the rest of the day setting up the servers at the new place and then taking transit back to the old place. Um, so yeah, a lot of that. A lot of just internet networking stuff. Um, I've got a little rack in here. It's the only rack that is open rather than enclosed. I mean, enclosed racks, I like them because it's just an easy cat-proofing measure. You can just be sure that as long as the rack is closed, then all the stuff inside is not going to get bitten by the cat. Um, I ended up going with an open rack in this room because I just had slightly different requirements. It wasn't like I need to store a bunch of equipment. It was more like I have a bunch of stuff that I need front access to. So putting a door on it didn't make a ton of sense. Um, but then that's trickier because I have to make sure that all the wiring inside of it is cat-proofed and that still isn't done. And there's just a bunch of non-cat-proofed wiring on the floor. So all those 75-foot SDI cables are 100% the kind of cable that Tuco would love to chomp on. Tuco has already chomped on one a tiny bit and uh, it was not good. I think you would have to chomp on the SDI cable quite a lot to cause it noticeable damage, but I don't want him biting the cables at all, right? Um, and it doesn't take a lot of chomping to mess up the insulation on an AC cord, never mind that like any amount of chomping on that could be dangerous for him. So definitely try to keep him away from the cords, but that's been hard. Um, so uh, yeah, I need to figure out this is this is why it seems so absurd when folks are asking like, oh, besides all the house stuff, what electronics projects are you doing? Because I I've I've been just overwhelmed with everything I'm doing for the past a while. Like I don't feel like I've had just like extra capacity to do my work and then also kind of just chill and then feel like I've done enough. Like I feel like I'm just doing whatever I can. And that's, that's just what I'm doing. I mean, it isn't like I never relax. You know, I, I mentioned I watched a movie, you know, I take breaks, but like, it's not like I can take a break and feel like I am on track. It's like, I'm always, I always feel like I don't really know what I'm doing and I have to be doing as much as I can to plan whatever comes next. So I don't really know what I'm doing next. And a lot of my limiting, my a lot of what's been limiting me lately is, my ability to plan what's coming next limits my ability to do what's coming next. And so yeah, it's like, well, how am I going to rewire the house? Like, what am I going to do first? I mean, there's a bunch of steps there and a bunch of moving parts and I need to make a bunch of decisions there still. Um, and you know, some of that's done. Like I've, I've got some of that locked down. Like, I think I know roughly what order I'm doing some of the things in, you know, I think I have some of the materials picked out, but there's also still a bunch of open questions. And then now we're in the middle of a pandemic and do I want to be wandering around the hardware store, you know? So there's just more to think about there. Um, cat proofing is still really my priority. So like doing fun projects online is kind of my overall, I don't know if that's my goal. I don't think doing fun projects online is actually my goal. I think that's a thing that I'm doing in the service of some goal that's kind of TBD, right? It's like, I want to be producing media that is useful. And I want to be producing media that like helps people out in their lives in some way, whether that's as companionship or education or fun or humor or something. I need to figure out what the angle really actually truly is because I'm tired of just kind of floating by. Um, but then like under there somewhere, there's this sub goal of, oh, we're making fun videos about electronics and like that's the carrier for whatever the other goals are. And that, that, that's not something I'm worried about. I just haven't been able to do that a lot because there's all this other stuff that I need to do with higher priority, like cat proof the house and set up the equipment that I'm using to do the electronics videos. Uh, and like, I don't have a desk. I need to buy a desk. Where am I even going to put that? So there's still a lot of like really basic stuff that I'm stuck on. <laughs> uh, 
Oh yeah, there's a comment from chat that well, maybe I can just live with the bad wiring for a while. I mean, that's part of the plan, right? It's not like I have my entire fuse box shut down until the wiring is perfect. I'm not planning on letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. I just need to have a plan for what the okay is and what the good is and what the better is and like how they all connect to each other. So that's that's all I'm getting at here. And obviously I'm doing something which is suboptimal here anyway, like I haven't replaced any of the old wiring in the building yet. There's still some knob and tube in use that's probably running like my porch light. I've got a giant extension cord running down the hall that I'm just hoping Tuco doesn't chew on. Like, I'm obviously just doing the things that I can without waiting for it to be perfect, but at the same time, all those things are causing anxiety, which is constant. So like, as long as that wire is powered and Tuco has access to it, I worry about it, and I have to kind of keep my eye on where Tuco is and kind of know what mood he's in. He gets in these different moods, which I kind of understand a little better now that I know him better. Like, you know, sometimes he really wants to explore and bite things and just like, like he's, he's more like, um, it's like, it's like cat extroversion or something. It's like, he wants to like have new experiences and like get to the bottom of new mysteries and that kind of thing. And when he's in that mood, I kind of have to keep him in the bedroom more because he will just start to like bite things to see if he likes them. But um, when he's not in that mood, he is usually pretty chill and he's usually just trying to find a good view or a comfortable location to hang out. And so when he's in that mood, he usually just wants to sit by the warm server exhaust or he wants to look out the window. And usually the worst he's going to do is tear up the window blinds to try to get a better view. Like, I feel like that mood, he's very directed. Like, he has a goal, he wants to be comfortable, or he wants a good view, or he wants food. Like, he is goal-oriented. And I can handle goal-oriented Tuco, because if I can figure out what his goal is, I can help him achieve the goal, and we can both be happy. It's when Tuco is in that, like, non-goal-oriented kind of, like, experiential sponge kind of mood, where he just wants to do new things and, and get into trouble, like, that's hard. And that is super stressful, and so I have to constantly be watching out for his mood transitions. <laughs> Christopher says, just give up and sleep in a nest of wires. You know, I mean, there's a lot of that aesthetic, right, in, like, hacker culture. Like, ah, oh, just, like, wires everywhere. We're, we're just, like, becoming one with the machines, like, whatever. But there's two things that really make that hard for me. One is that I care about fire safety, and the other is that I have a cat who eats wires. And so that kind of makes the nest of wires aesthetic really, really stressful for me. <laughs> Coax bad, fiber good. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, so I have not added any new permanent wiring in the house yet, but I've I've been taking out some coax. Um, just because that was easy to do, like while I was wandering around inspecting parts of the house, I could just bring my wire cutters and just pull stuff out. So I took out all the Comcast stuff. There is no more coax, which is nice. Um, and I like fiber a lot. It's just I, I have to worry about that because I think Tuco might chew on the fiber. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I don't think that would hurt him at all. It's just that I bet one good cat bite would just entirely ruin a $90 fiber optic cable. So I'm trying to avoid that situation where, you know, my $90 cat fiber optic cable is ruined. Um, yeah, there's plenty of Cat5 around here that Tuco will chew on, and it's not that big of a deal. Like, I scold him and try to keep him away from it, because I'm sure it's not great for him to be chewing on plastic, but he doesn't seem to swallow pieces of it, and he doesn't seem to break the cable's functionality for the most part. Um, it just seems like it's not good for his health to be chewing on plastic. But then there's, like, extension cords, like... I absolutely do not want to go on any AC cables. So like my usual rule is that anything AC is covered in this um, split loom tubing that keeps Tuco off of it. But because I'm in the process of getting stuff set up still, there's some cables that I have not fully cat proofed, um, specifically these really long extension cords. And I don't think I can do much about those because I don't think I even have enough cat proofing material for those. So I'm mostly just having to keep an eye on Tuco while that's out. Um, and then I could try to use those wire ducts that I bought to install in the house as temporary cat proofing, but that might be tricky because I don't want to cut any of those materials. And um, 
and I still don't really have a way of getting them into the racks or like, you know, I don't know how they get into this room. Like, I, I think I'd have to use them to um, protect most of the route, but then I'd still have unprotected wire in this room because I couldn't get the duct under the doorway. So stuff like that. Yeah, I'm putting in a little bit of fiber. Um, mostly I'm just trying to put in these uh, these ducts. So I'm using, um, what, is it, what is it called? Um, Carlon Resigard, which is a brand name of wire ducting. So I already bought a bunch of that in the two inch thickness, which is really substantial. Um, and so two inch diameter, just stuff it full of cat six cables and fiber and whatever else I want. Um, so, but that's only for low voltage. I'm gonna need to run AC separately, of course. Um, I've got this dream that I would really love to put in conduit for all the AC, but it's probably fine to just put in modern Romex cable, but I need to make more solid plans for how I do the actual a AC wiring. A lot of that involves having read through the electrical codes, which I currently have not. I've certainly been thumbing through like local codes and building codes and stuff, but I need to just like sit down and read the entire national electrical code, which I have not yet done. <laughs> Tuco Flyer needs a Sentinel mode. Yeah, for sure, right? Yeah, it'd be funny having some kind of Tuco Flyer set up in here. I mean, this is a very different space than my previous concrete box, which you're seeing behind me. Um, but maybe a Tuco Rover here, like a little a little wheeled bot that knows how to charge itself, perhaps. Um, and the Wi-Fi is certainly a lot better now that I've got a better system. So just, just with better radios, like I think these Unify access points have much better quality radios than the D-Link um, that I was using. But having three of them is pretty great. Just has better uh, spatial coverage. Plus it's using um, three different sets of channels. So I think if, you know, if like one channel was kind of sh like pretty bad, like in one particular area, then it might switch to a different access point. Cause I think I've been, it's like kind of hard to tell, but I think I might be seeing that already where I've got an access point in the garage and there's one camera in the garage that's talking to it, which is like I would expect, but then it's also talking to some like plug-in, um, like AC monitor switch devices that are in the house. So like some of those must have decided that the, whatever channel the garage's access point on just locally had a slightly better signal than whatever access point was actually closest. This is interesting. <laughs> it's a question of if, if there's a US version of John Ward. Who's, yeah, he's like, a, I guess, a British um, YouTuber who does a bunch of um, like electrical how-to kind of stuff, which is like useful, but also not sufficient, right? Like I, I wouldn't watch a YouTube video and then use that as sufficient information for rewiring my house. So... Yeah, I don't know, but it would be useful. Like, like what's the what's the kind of? I'm just trying to map like what is the, what's the Venn diagram intersection between what is YouTube capable of providing and what is useful from the point of view of a budding do-it-yourself electrician, right? And, and it's like, I don't necessarily want to be using YouTube as a replacement for reading the actual recommendation or actual regulations, but it's certainly useful to like, have a quick introduction from someone who does this on a regular basis. So like, oh, here's the standard practice. Here's what you should be looking at. I, I did find some of that. I was looking, looking around. Um, I think I was just trying to get an idea of like which kinds of ducting and conduit systems were available and that kind of stuff. And, and so, yeah, I found some videos on people doing installations in like new housing and in concrete slabs and different environments like that. And it was just interesting just like browsing around and seeing here's a bunch of people doing this completely normal construction procedure in a bunch of completely normal situations and, and just internalizing some of that so that I know what specifically to look for more detail in. Yeah, there's, there's more of a patchwork of codes around here. Um, like, the lo like the individual cities and counties typically adopt whatever the national code is, but then they can have their own little additions. So I think the way it works here is, and I, I'm gonna have to like double check all of this, but I think my city 
basically just adopts the California code, but then California has its own code, which is just like a very slightly adapted version of the national code. And so you you know you can download the California code, and it has um, margin notes that indicate like here's stuff that we copied, here's stuff that's new, and it's mostly copied stuff, but they do indicate that at least. And I mean, I also remember some of this from just helping my dad with work around the house. So, like, my dad's always been a homeowner as long as I know I knew him. Like, I think they. Gosh, where did they live when I was really young? I think they might. I, I mean, I know they rented for a while after moving to Colorado, but um, yeah. So I, I grew up mostly in Colorado. My family moved there when I was pretty young. And I think they rented just for a little while, and then they bought a house somewhere like as cheap as they could, and that's where I spent my entire childhood. And and so my dad was always the do-it-yourself type, and so there's good and bad there. Like I never learned how to interact with any professionals because my dad used this as a way to avoid his social anxiety, and I picked that up too. So I it's really hard for me to ask for help because my dad would never ask for help, but it also means that I. I've at least seen or helped him with a bunch of stuff like plumbing and electrical and, you know, various house repairs and a little bit of construction. We built like a little, um, like outdoor, we built like a swing set and like a little playhouse or something in the backyard. I remember like putting down gravel and putting in concrete posts and stuff like that. Um, or like setting wooden posts in concrete. So like I, it helped to be exposed to some of that early, but like I, he never read the electrical code. Like I don't think he cared about any regulations. Like I think he relied on living out where no one was going to harass him about it. So whereas I live in an actual city with actual infrastructure, so I think I might need to actually care slightly, even though, you know, it's not like they're just going to randomly inspect my wiring. I do actually care that it's safe for me and anybody else who lives here. Oh no. There's a comment that uh from Andy that his dad didn't understand neutral and hot and then wired their own house. It was kind of like a crapshoot of, of what way things were wired. Eesh. Yeah, that's that's not so good. And that was also in Colorado. See, I'm already nervous about what two goes up to. He's probably just sitting somewhere chill, enjoying the outdoors or whatever, but I don't know. <laughs> it's like tempting to go check on him. <laughs> Electrical code audiobook. I, I if I had a if I had the text, I could probably just do some text to speech, but I've got those scanned PDFs from um archive.org right now. <laughs> Chat seems pretty quiet, so maybe I will satisfy my curiosity and see what two goes up to, and I'll be right back. I mean, I guess I guess the microphone's coming with me, so. <sighs> oh yeah. See, I I figured it'd be up here, sitting on a chair in the front of the house next to the servers where it's a little bit warm. Hmm. Cuddle, cuddle. Yeah. I I like when it feels like Tuco and I are kind of getting on the same page with each other. Like I understand what he wants, and he kind of understands like what I want, and we can find some common ground. It feels really good to do that with anybody, really. But I think I think doing that with. Um, I don't know, like it's hard to generalize about the animal world since Tuco is really the first pet that I've been, you know, really close to. I mean, I've had fish before, right? But yeah, Tuco is, Tuco is my first pet that I could hold, you know, and that, that feels pretty special. Um, and so every time it feels like he and I are like emotionally on the same page, that's pretty nice. It feels... Um, 
it feels like nicer feeling that way with Tuco than it does with humans at this point. <laughs> I think with humans, it's got all this baggage associated with it. Like, like well, that's that's good now, but just wait till it gets painful. Whereas with Tuco, it feels like we can be a bit more real with each other. <laughs> Patrick Stewart reading the electrical code. That actually, I would pay for an audiobook of that, seriously. <laughs> that That's probably a waste of Patrick Stewart's time. Like, he's probably got better things to do. But if, if that existed, I would certainly patronize it. <laughs> how's, how's the weather? We could try a different... Uh, a different backdrop here. <laughs> I had a, I made a little automaton video that I was messing around with it and I put it in front of um, isopods, which I think is pretty cool, but I think a lot of po folks are kind of freaked out by bugs. So maybe I won't subject you to that. Oh, that was another thing that I had to, had to do was, um, yeah, so I, I had to coordinate moving the isopods, which, like, the isopods themselves are pretty low maintenance. They basically just need water, and they need to not be too cold or too hot. I mean, that's, like, why you can ship isopods by mail. Like, they, they're they pretty resilient, and they don't need that much. But, um, you know, I did, I did have this whole setup around them where I was streaming them, and... So I packed that up before moving and then moved the isopods at the same time that I moved Tuco. And then um, and then they were not online for a while while I was getting stuff set up. But the isopod stream is back. If you go to live.diode.zone slash isopod or isopod, <laughs> either of those work. Um, if you go there, you can, um, you can watch my isopods live. And there's usually not that much happening on that camera right now because I have it zoomed in pretty tight. Um, the thing I've been doing is running these motion sensitive time lapses on them so that it uh, it basically skips all the frames where there is no motion and looks only for frames that have a certain amount of motion at least and like accumulates frames until it reaches that threshold. So it kind of skips over all the areas of the recording where nothing's happening and, you, and then you just get the isopods and the other bugs moving around in there. I think it's cool, but it probably is kind of creepy for some people. <laughs> So I've got a bunch of those video files um, sitting on my server that I'm trying to figure out what to do with. Like, I want to do some kind of interesting project with all that isopod video, and I've been crunching it down with my time compression tool, but I'm not really sure what the end game is for that. <laughs> Sorry, I was laughing at a joke that I should really uh, tell for the audience. I hear the new Picard series is also a waste of his time. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think my delivery needs work. <laughs> Aw. Alexis says that she's a little freaked out by the bugs, but it kind of adds to their charm in a way. Like, she doesn't want to touch them, but their being freaky is cool. <laughs> we could try that. I have a really hard time not touching my face, as you're probably noticing. But luckily, I don't see a lot of other people every day, so it's relatively easy for me to self-isolate. I was going to meet this accountant today in person, but we ended up meeting over the phone instead. That was the change to my routine. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, gosh, it's such a, such a mess, right? And then it feels like there are all these different layers of tragedy that are happening at the same time with, you know, the actual human suffering caused by the disease itself. And then there's just the, like, mess of our system kind of collapsing under any weight at all. And then and then there's just, like, all the all the, like, oscillations from that, like, people reacting and then reacting to that and then reacting to that and 
I just wish the media would focus more on like the health aspects and the livelihood aspects than stonks or like you know like like the market fluctuations or whatever. It's like I I mean it's it's just not what's important, right? And like I have I have things that I'm personally worried about like like I don't know if it's going to be like harder for me to have enough money to pay my taxes this year that kind of thing but like i you know that's like tiny compared to what people are dealing with who you know can't get any hours to work so that they can pay their rent it's like we need to not give a shit about the stonks and we need to like give people a way to have housing and food even if they are not like viable in capitalism right at this moment because capitalism is full of shit so like it feels like the answer is just like right out there it's like oh actually this entire system is just aiming for the wrong thing we've been maximizing this made up number rather than actually trying to help people out and and maybe i mean you know maybe the fake number that we're maximizing you know it exists because we need some kind of system because we can't just always have everyone's needs in mind all the time but maybe we could at least admit this is a pretty bad system and we need to modify it so that it can actually take care of people if not just completely redo it so it just feels like one of those moments right I don't know who to talk to about this stuff though. Like I feel like my like I feel like I think about politics a lot and I think about just the frustration, but I don't know where to aim that. Um is I don't have a lot of people in my life and the people I do have in my life you know are not in a position to be revolutionaries. <laughs> you know, I have a I have a pretty bad relationship with my family and they also have pretty terrible politics and I just have basically given up on them at this point. And then I have some friends in the Bay Area still, but I wasn't seeing them very often, even when I lived in the Bay Area. And now I live a little further away and um, try to keep in touch with people, but it's like never been easy. And it never really seemed like I had like an especially functional cohort of friends in the Bay Area. So it's it's kind of like, well, everything here sucks. The system as a whole is obviously pointed in the wrong direction. But where are my peeps, right? Where are the people that I want to collaborate with to make something better? And I was hoping for a long time that I would find my peeps in the Bay Area because something brought me to the Bay Area. You know, there was some like magnet out there on IRC that pulled me there. You know, as I was hacking around on my GUI in high school with random people on Freenode, there was something in that whole mess that because I was the type to hack around on software to avoid everything else or whatever else, whatever reason, you know, that, that group that I was in pulled me toward the Bay Area. And so some part of that process, like I was their peep. I belonged there to some extent for a while. I certainly belonged there more than I belonged, you know, living with my, my parents or like at the college I went to, like both of those environments were definitely worse than the tech bubble thing for me personally. But the tech bubble thing is certainly bad for the world at large and it was a rather rather insular place to end up, right? Like you, you land in the tech bubble and the walls of the tech bubble are thick. Like it, it has a lot of incentive to keep you from wanting to get out. At least, you know, that's how I experienced it. And it seems like how a lot of my friends and coworkers experienced it. So it, it, it kind of distorts the way you see the world and makes you want to stay in and it makes it seem really good inside. But then the people that are experiencing that like weird kind of unreality are just given all this power. And yeah, so I mean, I, I, I decided that, that those people weren't my peeps. Like the peeps that I want to have around me, you know, I, I, I can't find um, community 
in um I don't think I can find community around like specific minutia of the constructed world. Like the things that we build and then and then we get really attached to the very specific pieces that we build them out of. You know, it's like there's this, you know, I, I feel like I talk about construction toys a lot because I spent a lot of time with those as a kid too, like like Legos or like Erector Set or whatever. And it's, I mean, that feels like a, a metaphor for so much of what we deal with in technology now. Like the the process of building a thing and kind of like pushing on the walls of the tech bubble and, and inflating it a little bit, like the actual process that you go through to make that happen is like building Legos. You take these existing pieces that have some interface and you attach them together. Like as much as people want to make something from scratch, you never do. And like the, the way in which you describe something and the, the pieces that you tell people that you're building on, like those all depend on your perspective and those. And anyway, I, I feel like that perspective was something I lacked. Like I, I didn't know, I didn't know how to see, you know, beyond that particular Lego kit that I was inside of. And, um, and the peeps that I found at that time were like fan clubs for specific bricks. It's like, oh, I'm the like one by two red brick fan club. And like, it's, it's a way to have a community, right? Like you need to have a group of people that is the right size in order to form social bonds with them. So it's like, well, if you're in this world where everything is just building stuff out of Legos, the whole world of people that are doing that, at the time I got there at least, was too big. Like you go to like Pound Linux or Pound Debian even on Freenode and there's just too many people there. But you you find like something that's more specific and that, that one by two red brick group is a tiny community where you can just really get into your one specific thing. And I, I don't know, I wonder how much of that is like the structure of the tech bubble and how much of it is like... Um, autistic special interest kind of behavior. And I mean, maybe those two things kind of reinforce each other. And that's like why it seems like folks that have been um, like, it seems like a lot of folks that find the tech bubble cozy are also maybe not so neurotypical. And maybe that's, I don't know, like, seemed like that might have been part of the process of how we found each other even before um you know even before we were all doing like software stuff on IRC maybe some of us like nerds that had similarly weird brains just found each other because of that and found each other because of the way that we saw the world and described it to each other So, I mean, I don't know, that that strategy of finding a small group of peeps based on a little slice of, of the broader interest that you could have, like, that still feels useful. Like, having too many people to choose from just is, that's also isolating. Like, you need a way to, to have a small enough group in front of you that you can actually get to know individuals. So I feel like that part was working, but then, you know, I, I start pulling on those threads and I start meeting people and I start trying to be more, I hesitate to say extroverted because I'm not really sure if that's what it was, but I try to push myself more to actually get out there and um, interact with people. I guess I tend to think of introversion and extroversion as being like, do human interactions drain you or recharge you? which isn't necessarily like, do you do the human interaction? Because sometimes you can have a lot of motivation to go interact with people, even if it's fundamentally draining. But I, I think I got into this mode where I was more like, I guess I would say a sticky side out. Like I was taking all the things that I had in me that other people might want to stick to and like putting them out there, which is very vulnerable because all this nasty stuff can like get stuck to you <laughs> if you put your sticky side out. But it also means other people might find you interesting and you might make new friends. So I was doing that for a while, and then it just felt like, <sighs> I mean, it, it just, I guess it felt like all of that just kind of exposed my naivety and last lack of experience with humans. Like, 
I was so hopeful that a lot of those relationships would turn into something that in hindsight was never even possible. Like, you know, I wanted things to be, um, you know, I think I didn't really know how to access the necessary kind of, um, like a realistic appraisal of reality at the time. Like, I, I feel like I was living in this um, kind of dis like a narcissistic distortion field. I don't know if anybody else has experienced like having a close family member who is like a clinical narcissist, but um, it, it can kind of like warp the way you feel. And I think for a long time, I didn't, I didn't really even understand what was happening because I was in this world where according to my mom, things could just be like superlatively great in this way that just centered her. And I feel like this would be easier with a concrete example. Uh, I don't, I don't think I have one right now. Anyway, I don't want to like dig super deep into that right now, but I guess I'm just trying to say that the, um, it reminds me a lot of, a lot of the way the Trump administration acts actually like this, this feeling that, um, or this, this projection that things are good because I'm telling you they are good. And that is the only reality that matters. You know, it is not your job to objectively judge your reality. It is my job for me to tell you what your reality is. And I feel like that's what Trump does. And that's what my mom does. Um, And then so I learned to do that to myself. Like I would tell myself like, like, oh, this, this friendship is perfect or this is, or like we are just absolutely like right there with each other, like through thick and thin, like everything is going to be like right there on the same page. And I didn't know how to judge any of those situations accurately. So I just kind of substituted it in with that kind of like semi-narcissistic optimism that I learned from my mom. Which uh, is an interesting antidepressant, I guess, right? Like, I, looking back on that time period when I was just, like, going full steam ahead into that, like, sticky side out, just, like, meeting people and putting myself out there and, like, damn the consequences. And... <sighs> yeah, I had no idea what the consequences would be at the time. And it's not like I had any social role models because my folks are super isolated on purpose. I've, I tried to kind of change that in them a while ago. And then I think after a bunch of therapy, realized that that's, that's really just the way they are. <laughs> like, but it doesn't mean I have to want to interact with them at all. Oh, I let the chat fall asleep again. <laughs> if only we could admit that capitalism is full of shit. Exactly, right? It's just it's just sacred right now, right? Like you can't like if you even hint that you aren't 100% behind capitalism, then it's just like a liability for the entirety of media and like you're just radioactive and it I I, I am so tired of it. I I just don't like I I not only is it something that I'm tired of at a very large scale sense, like how do we change this in society? I'm, I'm just tired of it in this very micro sense. It's like, where do I, where do I find again, peeps? Where are my peeps that are motivated to help figure out something better? And like, how do I interact with those people? And like, what levers do we have available to pull together to make that happen? Hmm. Another interesting comment that um, uh, from Les that they only end up they never end up focusing on any particular thing long enough to stick in any of the communities because they never stay fixated on one thing for very long. I I I I feel that too. Like um, 
there are certainly things that I've gotten just really, really attached to, like that GUI that I spent five or six years building and like a bunch of embedded computing stuff. And like, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that I just got downright obsessed over. But then there's also just so much that I have so much trouble concentrating on. And I'm just, I'm just like bouncing from thing to thing to thing. Um, but I think that's also a reason why it's valuable to have communities that aren't just based on things. And they aren't based on like what project you're working on today. Um, which, I, I mean, that's definitely been something that I've felt over the past, I don't know, like years, decade or whatever, like feeling like, um, like I wished I had more friends that were, uh, I mean, maybe that, maybe I won't say that I wish, because I feel like that is kind of how it's happened. Like, the people that I did end up forming good friendships with were the people that I had basically no interests in common with. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's not totally true. I mean... Oh, that's what I'm looking for. It's not people that I had no interests in common with, because the, the friends that were really good, we had certainly plenty of interests in common. It was that we didn't have obsessions in common, and that actually felt useful. Because if I have a friend that I like share an obsession with, then we're just gonna like go all at that obsession until like one of us ends up like needing a breather from it or getting bored or whatever, and then that friendship is gonna totally fall apart. <laughs> That's definitely happened to me. Um, but then you know I've also had much more durable friendships where it's not about a shared interest so much as it's about like a like shared situation or shared values or something like that and you know that has varied degrees of success but it seems like a better foundation hmm yeah that sticky side out feeling i was i was like really in that mode especially in like 2013 or so like around the time that i was doing like burning man stuff and like interacting with lots of people and like making big art objects and going to events a lot and I was just doing tons of that and I, I just didn't really know I didn't have any I didn't know what my goals were socially it's like what does it mean to have a good social interaction what does it mean to be good friends like I just didn't know any of that and so I was just like trying everything and then that leads me to a bunch of friendships that I um that I ended up feeling just like, uh, like tragically disappointed in, and like a lot of the friendships failed because I just didn't know what I was doing, and like a lot of it was my fault. But then some of the stuff that just ended up um, like breaking me the worst was um, more like uh, just like misjudging people, like trusting people way more than I really should have. You know, like, people that, you know, I was there when they were having a really hard time, and then it wasn't even that I expected them to be there for me when I was having a bad time, but but then, like, I was having a bad time, and they show up just to make it even worse, like that kind of thing. Um, I still don't know how to get past that. Like, that, that particular thing that caused me to lose my trust in basically all of humanity happened five years ago now more than five years and I still haven't gotten over it maybe just a tiny bit but not much and it feels like that's the kind of thing that takes a while to get past This is a comment that uh, I, don't, I think this is in, in reference to like friends that are really good and, and you have shared interests that it's good when you stay up till 2 a.m. doing something with them. Yeah, I mean, I, f I feel some of that. Like, um, I, I guess I want to distinguish between like project buddies and and like deeper friendships because like I've certainly had people in my life where you know, we we would regularly just, like, stay up late working on stuff together, but then we would never talk about anything personal. 
And it, it, I think it took me a while to realize that there are all these different like dimensions of connectedness. Like there's spending time together and there's things that you can do together, but then there's also just like layers of yourself that you share with people, which seems really obvious to me now, but I, I think I just didn't even really get that at a certain age because my family was just so socially dysfunctional. And like my folks still just don't share that with anyone. Like they, that's, I mean, maybe not entirely true because there's, there is definitely, there's definitely a very big difference between like their public face and the side of them that I saw growing up, but they also just don't know how to be real with anyone as far as I can tell, like especially my dad. My, my dad, I don't think, I don't think he knows, like I, I feel like he's just like destroyed any capacity to feel emotions other than anger. Um, which isn't to say that he's an especially angry person. Like, he's pretty chill most of the time, but he also just doesn't really experience emotions anymore. And I, I could be wrong, but I, I think that's something he did it intentionally because of some bad shit that happened to him. So, I don't know what to do with that. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. It's like my, my mom was the one who just kind of like slathers everyone else with her emotions. It's just like emotional diarrhea. And then my dad is the one who just doesn't allow himself to think or feel anything unless it's extremely pragmatic. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Start a podcast. Is that kind of what we're doing here? I mean, I think it's better if, if you have a co-host, right? Like, that was one thing I was thinking about as far as formats. Maybe there's a way that we could have a, more of a conversational format for this. I don't have any roommates currently. I talked with my... Be, be, back when I had a roommate, we would talk sometimes about doing um, doing a thing together, like a project together, but that never materialized. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm really sorry if, if anybody else feels like that. Yeah. It, yeah, there, there's a comment in chat that the family talk feels familiar. And yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I know a lot of people have shitty situations and my situation is certainly not as shitty as a lot of them, but it, yeah, I don't know. Family sucks. I mean, family doesn't always suck. That's that's the other thing is I, <laughs> I still I still feel much more connected, even though I haven't seen them in years. I still feel much more connected to my ex's family than to my birth family. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's funny. I should, I don't know, like I don't know. My my ex and I are pretty disconnected at this point, but it would be interesting to go say hi to his family because I feel like we'd probably still get along. <laughs> oh yeah, could we do a call-in show? How would we do that? Oh gosh, I guess that is a topic to talk about, right? Like, um, like how do you even do the technology side of that? Um, which isn't to say that there aren't ways of doing it. Of course, there's a bunch of ways to do it. It's just, I find them all annoying. Like, so many people use Discord now. I, I am so frustrated with Discord, and maybe I should just suck it up and we should use Discord anyway, but I just, I hate platforms. All the platforms suck. Can you just send me IP packets? Just, like, netcat your microphone into a port, and we can just do it that way. No, that's, I mean, you need, you need infrastructure, right? It's just, it's just frustrating when there isn't an obvious piece of public infrastructure to do something that seems like it should be straightforward. And it, that feels like at the core of a lot of the battle that open source types were fighting in the 90s, like this battle to have a baseline of public infrastructure, at least in the software world, which the software world is this tiny, tiny world, right? It's like, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't even have hardware. Like you can't even rely on open source software to build you an entire computer. And even an entire computer is not really that much in this world of meat that we live in. But 
within that tiny little sphere of software. Like that whole battle was, we think anyone should have access to at least this basic set of things. But it wasn't really seen as, as like a kind of political equity thing by a lot of people, because there was also this, um, this kind of selfish angle to it, right? Like you just build the stuff that you need to use yourself and that you give it away because it's easier to give it away than to not give it away sometimes. Or you give it away because you get an ego boost for it, or you give it away because, you know, you want to advertise something, or you give it away so that you can put it on your resume. Like there are all these reasons that people do it. Um, hmm. Gosh, I lost it. Oh yeah, we were talking about um, call-in show stuff. So infrastructure, like how would we have, um, how would we do that? And and like right now, the things that most people rely on for this are really just like little walled gardens. Like you can be inside the Slack ecosystem or inside the Discord ecosystem or whatever. And it's it's not like an internet standard or anything. It's just it's just a thing that some company happens to be doing out there. But yeah, we could do Discord or, I don't know, like Skype or analog telephone. <laughs> I'm glad not everyone, I'm glad to hear someone else has a good relationship with their, uh, their ex's mom. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know how she's doing. I, sh I should really... I'm actually just terrible at keeping in touch with people. I think it's partly the social anxiety and partly just not really knowing how to do it. <laughs> oh, cool. Alexis volunteers to netcat a microphone. Yeah, so how would we do this? Would we, I mean... <sighs> I mean... Usually the point is you would want it to be a conversation which has low latency audio both directions, which means it's more of, you know, a telephony program running at the same time as the stream. Um, I mean, I think as far as like the setup over here, I could actually just run a chat program on my usual demo machine um, and somehow route a microphone to it. Oh, oh, right. I, I installed a new toy. Um, my streaming machine, I, I, I have this driver on there called the Synchronous Audio Router, which is this open source Windows driver that lets you, um, I, don't know, I don't know how many out there do like Windows audio stuff. In, in Windows audio, there's um, ASIO, which is basically like, it's like Jack. It's, you know, it's like a synchronous audio framework where the driver gives you a callback on a real time thread you fill a buffer with audio or take audio out of a buffer and and that's all. Like that happens at a real time predictable interval in a like a separate high priority thread um, synchronously. So there's no buffering or there's very minimal buffering. There's just a little chunk of samples that the sound card stores in memory, like 64 or 256 samples or whatever. And then that little tiny buffer goes to all the audio, all the audio applications that need it right away doesn't get like queued. There's no queue, so um, synchronous. And so the interface for that in, in Windows is ASIO. Uh, so anyway, synchronous audio router or SIR is a wrapper that takes an ASIO device and then gives you another ASIO device around it, which has the same synchronous properties, but it also lets you kind of pipe in additional inputs and outputs. So you can create like a loopback device so that audio output from one application can go into the input channels on your ASIO device and vice versa. So anyway, that, that's that been helping out a lot. Before I tried that, um, like years ago when I was first setting this up, I tried some Windows like virtual audio cable devices and I ended up having, I think I tried two different ones and they both had problems with um, just like dropping frames after a while because they would buffer the audio and the source and the sync wouldn't run at exactly the same rate, and so they would end up eventually dropping packets, dropping audio frames. Um, so anyway, this this just seems to solve that problem pretty neatly because everything is synchronous and runs off the same audio clock. Everything else ends up then running off the same clock as that main ASIO interface, which for me is a USB device that's sitting right over there. So, 
Yeah, I think with that, I could like run whatever program we end up wanting on the same machine that's doing the streams. And then it's just the, the bike shed question of like, which of the many bad options do we want? I should probably just set them all up and then we can just use whichever one is good for the particular guests we have. But if it's like a call-in show, it needs to be something that's easy to access, which I mean, it seems like people use Discord for that a lot successfully. I would just have to swallow my disgust and set up a Discord channel. Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody else have, have thoughts about this? <laughs> Someone's like Mixer.com or GTFO. Is that one? What is Mixer? I, I've i heard of that as a streaming service, but I didn't know that would do like conversations or anything. And then someone else says StreamYard. What is StreamYard? Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. You know what? I really hate landing pages. Just the entire concept of landing pages. <laughs> I should really be showing you my screen, but I don't have that set up right now. Um, I, I'm just saying that because I go to the streamyard.com and it's like a whole bunch of marketing fluff and I have no idea what this product actually does or what it is or if it's free or what it costs or what it's actually made out of. It's just a bunch of marketing stuff telling me what all these happy people used it for, which is like a uh, pretty generic, I don't know. Oh, and someone else asked where the cat is. He is, um, I was just out there looking for him and he's probably in the same spot. He was sitting on uh, a chair in the, I guess I'm calling it the dining area. It's It's got a table and it's next to the kitchen and it also has the servers in it. So it's kind of a dining data center. Oh, and another question about how Tuco is. Yeah, Tuco has been doing great, I think, actually. Um, I was I was preparing for him to be, um, for him to need a bit of an adjustment period for this place, but he, he really, um, it seems like he really took to it even faster than I was expecting. Um, he's mostly been in the bedroom because that's like, that's like the area that I've, mostly cat proofed there's still a couple things in there that really shouldn't be but for the most part the bedroom is cat for cat proof so um like if he's in one of his moods where he's just like biting everything and i need a safe place to be with him i'll just go in there with him and shut the door or like at night or when i'm out so i can't keep an eye on what he's doing i tend to keep him in the bedroom with the door closed which he seems to like a lot um he's got all of his toys and he's got his cat wheel and um and he's got a couple of good perches where he can look out the window. And so he's been spending a lot of time in there, even when I have the door open and he could be anywhere. He still seems to like the bedroom a lot. Um, but yeah, he also likes that spot in the server area because it's, I assume it has a neat kind of ambience because, you know, it's got, um, it's got some windows. It's got, I mean, the blinds are closed, so we probably can't see that much out the windows and they're, it's dark, but you know, it's got like, you know, people in cars and stuff going by. I think it's mostly because of the warmth. Um, it's going to be a little cold in the bedroom right now. And he's got a heated pad in there, which he stays on quite a lot. But I think, yeah, when he can, he likes to camp out um, next to the server exhaust where it's a little warmer. Oh, yeah, um, I did move. I should mention that. Yes, I, I moved. Um so the place you're seeing behind me is a green screen video. That's just for fun. That was the old place. Um, I'm now in a house which is in California and it's great. Um, yeah, no, it's been a lot of work, but I, yeah, so I moved, I moved from this um, concrete box that I was in before to like an actual house, which has been both stressful and pretty great. Um, 
but yeah, that was what I, that's what I've been preoccupied with for the last bit. Like I, I have so much stuff, like I have so much objects in my life. Um, so it probably took me like a month, month and a half of just packing to get all my stuff packed up like late last year. And the, so there was packing and actually trying to figure out where to move. And, um, the actual process ended up happening kind of really rapidly. Um, I was kind of at this point where I, I was just, I don't know, like we're just ready to table flip the whole Bay Area. Like I just needed to go. And I, I'd been feeling like that for years at that point, but it had just reached the, this point where I just couldn't deal with it anymore. Like I just really needed to get out of the Bay Area. Um, so that was that was late last year. Um, I mean, it was for a bunch of reasons, but um, I think a combination of just like stuff not working out super well for me in the barrier, like feeling like, um, like a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do just turned out to not, like once I did it, I didn't like it. Like I tried, I tried doing like art at museums and I even got a piece in a show at a museum. And once I got there, I was like, Oh, actually that's terrible. Nope. never mind. Not doing that again. Bye. And, um, same thing with the tech industry. It's like, oh, I worked in software in the Bay Area for a long time and nope, not doing that. Um, so I don't know. I, I tried some of those things with the place I was in. I tried, um, running these workshops for LED art and I tried, um, doing a bunch of tech consulting work from there and I was going to try to run more events, but it was just this combination of social anxiety and, my interpersonal everything falling apart and then just feeling like the Bay area was, was not where I wanted to plant my seeds. Like I don't want to grow anything here. It's not sustainable for me. Like even if I can personally have a place that I could live in sustainably, which certainly wasn't a given there, I didn't think I could find community in the Bay area. It just felt like every time I got close to some group of people, it, felt like, oh, actually, there's a reason I should be running as fast as possible in the opposite direction. So, so yeah, that's what I was doing a lot of last year. Um, and then I, I was doing some house hunting because I, I, I was just tired of this Bay Area rent and I figured that I could, um, that I could make it work if I moved somewhere um, a good bit cheaper and bought a house there. So I was starting to look into how I could do that. And then and then stuff kind of started happening way faster because I found this place that I that just seemed like a really good fit for what I needed. Um, and so I started trying to figure out if that would work. And then um, and then it just got faster because um, you know, it did look like it would be just right, or at least, you know, as, as good as I could hope to find. And, um, and I thought I had time, but then like the seller wanted to step up their schedule and I had to make a decision faster. And so that started all happening. And so, I, yeah, a lot of last year was just like whirlwind of getting stuff ready for this and making it actually happen, getting the house and getting stuff set up enough that I could actually move in and making a bunch of trips, moving stuff with the help of a bunch of my neighbors doing so much packing and so much unpacking. And I still have, just, just, I have this huge pile of foam in my backyard from unpacking everything that I've still been just like throwing away bit by bit as I can. Um, I've still got some stuff that is just not even unpacked, but a lot of most, I mean, pretty much everything is at least partially unpacked at this point. I don't think I have any boxes. No, I mean, there are a couple in the garage, but other than in the garage, I don't think I have boxes that are just like completely not even started unpacking at this point. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, this is like why I don't have like fancy, shiny electronics content coming to you 24 7 because I've just got a bunch of like real life stuff that I've been overwhelmed by constantly.
Hmm. <laughs> oh, we got a hello from Uganda, which I missed earlier. Hello. How are things over there? How's your how's the healthcare system holding up? And then another comment that um, uh, they really enjoyed the art stuff. I'm trying to figure out how to how to get back into that because I've I mean, in the abstract, the concept of creativity and I enjoy that muchly. Like, <laughs> sure, creativity, why not? Let's let's make stuff. Um, but I've been trying to figure out like how to kind of reboot that for me a bit. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was doing between um, between 2010 and 2015, let's say, um, feels hard for me to access right now because it's wrapped up in some trauma that I still need to get past. Um, like the the art stuff. Um, you know, like I, I'd always, I've always been interested in, um, I don't know, like, I mean, it feels weird to even say that, like, oh, I've always been interested in art, because like art just feels like part of the human condition that should be accessible to everyone, right? But, um, but yeah, it felt like something that, with all this hindsight, like looking back on my childhood, it was something that I wanted to dive into significantly more than I actually felt capable of. Um, I, I have these memories of like, um, you know, making stuff that I really liked that I just couldn't get anyone else interested in. And then like being told like, oh, this is art. You need to do this kind of art. And then like just having no success at that at all. Um, so, like I would make these little paper models when I was in ele elementary school. Um, I would just like cut up three by five index cards and just use like scissors and glue and, and make little models of stuff. I would make these like elaborate control systems that could have been like, um, you know, like the mission control at NASA or something. Um, just cause you know, it, it was cool. I would, I would make little like, you know, CD ROM changers and stuff like that out of cardboard. <laughs> um, but of course, like, you know, that was just for me, like no one else. I don't think I even ever told my family about that. And um, I would just like do it during like whatever time I could scrounge up at school. And of course, my teachers hated it because I wasn't paying attention. I mean, actually, the thing was I needed my hands to be doing something. Otherwise, I couldn't pay attention to anything. But teachers didn't really understand that. Um, Oh, and then later on, I remember the first piece of furniture that I ever bought on my own was this really shitty desk, but it was like, I wanted a place to draw. And so I got this like really tiny, like flimsy desk and a roll of paper and I would just like draw random stuff on there. I like to draw these like really sprawling, like kind of almost like Dr. Seussy kind of like cityscapes, just like bizarre landscapes, stuff like that. I don't know. I don't think I still have any of that stuff. But then I, you know, the first time I remember going to like an actual art class in school, they wanted me to draw people and I hate drawing people. Like I try to avoid people as much as possible. You think I want to pay super close attention to their proportions and muscle structure? I mean, nowadays I'm kind of interested in that, but at the time I certainly wasn't. And so, yeah, they just wanted me to make like self-portrait and and then they would just like ridicule me about the proportions without actually giving me the information that I needed to make better decisions. And, you know, so I didn't, I didn't really figure out how to access a form of creativity that felt good and sustainable until much later. Um, so, I mean, it helped a lot to have some folks in that clique of art weirdos that I met in San Francisco, just kind of, like they were, they were weird in a lot of ways and dysfunctional in a lot of ways. And they were really bad at not having sexual assault in their communities. But, uh, 
they also were pretty good at getting across this message that like it's okay to just like make stuff and make art and think of yourself as an artist if you want and you could just do that I mean I mean I don't know it's like it's like the kind of energy that is useful in certain contexts but I wouldn't want to amplify like um I don't know like like uh like self-care rituals for like well-off white women you know it's like sure they need to exist I'm sure they're helpful but I'm not gonna amplify that like that's not what I need to see more of in the world right now so that kind of feels like the kind of message that I had at the time for myself like like that, like, oh yeah, it's all cool, art, art's cool, like, we can just make art together, yeah, it's all fine, like, and, and like that, that was like maybe what I needed at the time, but I don't know that that was actually good in general. So I'm still trying to figure out how to reconnect with art as a concept. Yeah, I mean, I tried approaching it from that, like, kind of weird art click kind of burner scene angle and had a bunch of problems from that angle. And then I tried approaching it from like the, um, the like art institution kind of angle. And I mostly didn't like that either. I still like this, uh, like broadcast kind of thing where I make stuff and then like put it out there and then maybe you like it and maybe we talk about it. I feel like that is a model that has potential. <laughs> I just don't know how to make the social part of it work. It's like, how can we have that back and forth conversation without relying on some unreality? Because I think a lot of social media is this parasocial unreality where people feel more of a connection than there actually could ever possibly be. And I don't want to cultivate that. Like, I don't want to suck people into a falsehood. I just want to have a channel. So yeah, maybe a call-in show. <laughs> maybe that's what we need to do. <laughs> hmm. Oh yeah, another comment that I don't like the idea of moving, packing my life into a box. Yeah, right, like I, I, I feel that a lot. Like, I also feel this tension though, like, moving um so i i clearly have a bunch of junk and moving at least this past time was really complicated um i've never had a really easy move like when i moved from colorado to california that was a big truck that i drove with my dad um i got really interested in having um in like simplifying the physical objects in my life for a while because they cause me a lot of stress. Um, like I, I mean, I feel like I'm constantly surrounded by clutter because I just have so much stuff that I need to move around and deal with and like keep nearby, but I really don't like clutter. Like it just stresses me out. Um, so at least for a while there's, there's definitely this, um, I think the other thing is, uh, yeah, at the time I was living with a bunch of like tech folks in San Francisco who had been moving around a lot and didn't have a lot of stuff and liked this nomadic ideal of being able to move around a lot, but also practically speaking, they didn't need to have a bunch of stuff. Um, and that was an interesting situation to confront, just like feeling like, well, I, I guess I'm just thinking about this moment of time when like me and the people around me all had really different relationships with physical objects and that was coming into sharp focus. Because I, I had for a long time been struggling with like clutter and having more things than I actually want, but kind of needing to have some amount of junk around to be able to do the like electronic-y stuff that I've always done. So there's been the tension in me between like, well, this is the stuff I've always been doing 
do I want to be doing it? It seems to require a lot of stuff. I don't know that I like stuff, but if I can learn to manage the stuff, then maybe I can keep doing the thing that I like, and maybe I like it. I don't know if I really do, but I guess I do. So like that's kind of how I've been feeling. But then I was around all these like San Francisco hippies that really liked the idea of having very few things and being nomadic and like living out of a backpack and whatever. But that only works if you can like buy a lot of stuff and not have to stockpile food and medicine and if you can largely like rent anything that's large like vehicles and housing so like there's a certain amount of a like specific privileged position that you have to be in in order to just like choose to be very light in your objects you know people that are more constrained in what they're doing may want to have fewer objects in their life but also have limitations that require the objects to be around so like i had the work stuff i was doing but then like i also had friends that just needed to stockpile food because they were poor and they didn't have you know they didn't have the luxury of just going out to eat a lot or buying like small containers of food they had to buy the like 50 pound bag of rice because it was cheaper and but now you have a 50 pound bag of rice in your life and you've got to move that around so yeah, yeah that that conflict between um, the stress that comes from the objects and the freedom that comes from the objects just feels like it's always going to be part of life and uh, moving <laughs> moving is one of those moments where I think I guess like everybody has to deal with that but when I was you know when I was feeling really nomadic and I, I guess I, I couldn't just pack up everything into the tiniest space but before I adopted Tuco I did travel and I traveled pretty light for a while um, like I, I spent this week in New York with only this, only this like tiny bag, um, spent a month in Thailand with a relatively small bag, but those, you know, those were trips. That wasn't life. That was stepping outside of the normal into something else. Uh, someone asked why, but I'm not sure what they were asking about. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Did I try to keep traveling light with Tuco? Um, since that point, I haven't really had the option. So... <sighs> I mean, I haven't really been able to travel since adopting Tuco. Like, I don't have a place where I can leave him. I don't think I have a good way to travel with Tuco without a vehicle. So, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really been traveling a lot in the past several years, like definitely not since adopting Tuco. Back when I lived in that, um, so before I moved to the previous place that you're seeing behind me, before I moved there, I lived in this, um, kind of weird, illegal warehouse thing with a bunch of hippies in San Francisco. And that was where I was living when I adopted Tuco. Um, and at that point, I think there was this idea that if I needed to go on a trip or if I needed to do something, whatever, then my roommates could help take care of Tuco. Uh, I was vastly overestimating how responsible my roommates were at that point. Um, but that whole house was a huge shit show in all sorts of ways. Um, I think I did take one work trip. Like, I think I went to a conference. Like, that might have been the one I went to in South Korea um, and, and relied on my roommates to take care of Tuco. But I also just, I also wasn't taking as good a care of Tuco back then as I really should have been. Like, he, he, um, <laughs> he was pooping on the roof for a long time and I didn't even know it. <laughs> It took me a long time to figure out what was going on. Uh, and he shouldn't have even been able to get up there. <laughs> uh, and then I, I tried making, um, I tried building this screen to keep him off the roof. And then my roommates were bad about actually keeping it in place. Uh, I, I'm sure it's safer for both of us to not be living there anymore. Um, 
But yeah, I haven't had an easy time traveling light. Like, I haven't really been able to travel in general since adopting Tuco. And for like my own personal set of objects, like, I had a bunch of stuff when I moved from that weird place into the previous place. Um, that was a very hasty move because I had to just like GTFO that other place really quickly. Um, cause my roommates violated my trust in a pretty serious way. So I ended up getting a temporary place to live while I found a new place and then doing a really hasty move. Um, and at that point, a lot of the stuff I was moving was like tools that I had boxed up that I had still with me from my previous move. You know, I had some electronics tools, I had some computer stuff. Um, I bought a lot more stuff after moving to the previous place though. So like all the rack mount stuff, most of the computer stuff, all the furniture pretty much, like all of that was stuff that I bought after moving into the previous place. So my move definitely got more complicated. Um, like this, this last move was, I mean, honestly, I was feeling really stuck in that place because the move, like I, I was having trouble imagining the move. It was just so complicated and difficult. And I'd gotten to that point, which, I mean, I guess I've been in this point before where I've been like so deep in a situation that I can't figure out how to get out. And it just feels like I'm, I'm doomed. And I, I'm like stuck there forever. Or I, you know, I just can't get out. I felt that way in a relationship before. Um, like I just could not see past it. It felt like it felt like that relationship was like absolutely ideal. And if I didn't see it that way, it was my own problem. And um and that like it's because I had already decided that, that relationship was absolutely ideal, then if I felt terrible and trapped and awful in the relationship, it was just because there was something wrong with me and I might as well jump off of a bridge or something. Um, so, I mean, I was feeling almost that bad about the previous place. I, I mean, not, not quite that bad, but it was in the same direction. And so I, I knew I had to actually get out, but it was also one of those situations where the move was just so, such a big thing like looming out in front of me that I was having trouble visualizing it and having trouble imagining a future that extends past it. I mean, given how 2020 is going so far, maybe the future didn't extend past it, and maybe I actually did die last year, but it wouldn't be the first time I felt like that. I had a moment like that pretty severely in, like, 2014, where I was absolutely certain I was dying. I, I mean, it's a long story. I don't want to get into why, but I, I was just feeling, like, really bad, and I don't know. I did, I think. But sometimes I think back and I wonder, like, actually, maybe I did die. Maybe everything since then, because it's been so off the rails since then. Maybe that's just like the best reality that my non-functional brain is able to dream about at this point in the afterlife. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting thing to think about, maybe. But we've just got to make make our way forward however we can. So I, yeah, I just need to figure out who my peeps are. It's like, I, I got out of the bad housing situation, both of them. <laughs> yeah, I got out of that terrible place in San Francisco with all the unreliable hippies, and I got out of the expensive place in the Bay Area. And now this, this could be all right. This could be stable. I just need to know who my peeps are and what I'm actually doing. Oh, and I I know um, I know a lot of you are my peeps. Like I, I I feel like I I'm just like really bad at I'm bad at acknowledging the friends and connections that I do have, so I don't want to go in that direction. I I just also feel like I don't know how to manage the kind of parasocial tar pit that social media represents, and so like how can we have something that is real? but is also not isolated. Like a connection that doesn't rely on kind of coating everything in a thick layer of unreality so that we can feel good about it. Had way too much of that growing up and we have way too much of that in the current US government. 
I also need to find a new therapist. <laughs> yeah, I guess I mentioned I broke up with my therapist, but yeah, that would probably help with some of this. What? Somebody's like, why am I making my life hard? The cat is not my problem. I mean, yeah, actually he is. I'm responsible for him. So like, I do actually have to take care of my cat. And if you don't think an animal that you are responsible for is actually something, something that you need to take care of, then like, you definitely shouldn't be responsible for a cat. <laughs> Oh, and then there's another question about where my code for Tuco Flyer is. Um, yeah, that's all in a Git repository. There's actually, I made a separate organization for that because there's a bunch of repositories. Um, let me make sure I know where that is. I think if you just go to github.com slash Tuco Flyer, it'll go there. <laughs> Why is my E repository in there? That's funny. Oh, Tuco's back. Hey, Tuco. Yeah, so if you go to github.com slash TucoFlyer, again, I don't have this set up to show you on the actual stream right now, because I <sighs> there's still a bunch of HDMI stuff that I need to wire up before that works. Hey, boy. But yeah, it's got, um, it's got a bunch of separate projects in there. If you're looking for the object tracking, um, that is all probably out of date now because given how fast um, deep neural net stuff has been going, like you can probably find significantly better software for that. But I was using this research project called YOLO. Um, what does that actually stand for? Oh yeah, you only look once. It's, um, yeah, it was, I mean, there are probably more of these now, but it was, it was like the first popular um, convolutional network where it wouldn't try to match um, each object class over the image separately, but it would match all the object classes simultaneously over the entire image. So it was much faster at doing real-time object detection. Tuco is sniffing all the sandbags. <laughs> they all probably smell interesting because some of them are sitting outside. So yeah, the actual object tracking is YOLO, which is um, YOLO itself is the name of the neural network architecture. Um, the implementation of that architecture was part of a project called Darknet, but um, that was a really kind of hacky implementation, and you can probably find better ones now. Um, and then I wrote an OBS plugin that used the uh, that used the object detection network to process the live video on OBS and then send the results over a WebSocket to the bot server. Tuco, you're making me so nervous, honey. Let's see if I can pick up Tuco. Tuco, do you want to cuddle? Hmm. Whoa. There's like some weird flickering on the screen and I can't tell if that's in the background video or in the green screen itself. It's probably in the background video. <laughs> Sometimes Tuco is definitely in a wandering mood, but he's also like there's a tension between the wandering and the face rubs. It's like, oh, you really want to get up and wander, but oh, the face rubs are so good. So he's sitting here with like really tense arms, like he wants to get out and do something, but he's also just kind of melting into the face rub. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that's the thing, like pets are such a big responsibility and like Tuco, I mean, he's like having a kid. Like, I mean, I've never had a kid. I'm sure kids are harder, but like, 
I've definitely heard people compare Bengal cats to having a toddler, just in how much stuff they're always getting into. Hey, Tuco. Oh, honey. Meow. Meow. Yeah, I feel like I, like Tuco and I seem to understand each other now just so much better than we did even a few years ago. We had this scary moment when, I guess this was shortly after I moved into my previous place, so it would have been like middle of 2015 or like early 2015. Um, and Tuco was also a lot younger. Hey, boy. He's in his wandering mood, and he's sniffing at the wires. <laughs> but he's... Yeah. <laughs> he wandered back into the bedroom. I think he might be headed for some food or something. Uh, yeah, I, so I had this scary moment where... Um, oh, he's running on his wheel. Oh, now he's back. <laughs> hey, Tuco. So I was working on this art project... Um, this was the this was the orb thing that I made a while ago um, for this show at the Contemporary Jewish Mu Jewish Museum in San Francisco. Oh, now Tuco's biting Cat Five cables. Tuco, don't do that. I'm not gonna scold him super hard for biting the Cat Five cables because I'd kind of rather he bite those than the ones that are actually important. Ooh, don't tote Tuco, to don't. <sighs> oh, that was an SDI cable. <laughs> Definitely just chomped. <sighs> Tuco! Okay. You're gonna go back in the bedroom for a bit, okay? Yeah. I think he was napping or relaxing at least in front of the server exhaust fan, and now he's in the mood to play and run and do energetic stuff, so I'm probably gonna have to go in there and uh, and play with him a bunch in just a minute. Yeah, he, he needs a lot of interaction. Like, if you leave him alone, he will get bored and antsy, and when he's bored and antsy, he will find ways to entertain himself, which is not a problem in general, but, it, I mean, he will he will find some really creative ways of destroying stuff if you let him. So, like, if you're going to let him entertain himself, you have to be sure that the place is very well cat-proofed. <laughs> comment that uh, Andy finds Tuco's olfactory interests much more interesting than the latest deep learning algorithms. Yeah, I, I love watching Tuco explore and just trying to imagine how things are for him. Like, I really love trying to empathize with Tuco. And I mean, there's, there's certainly a species boundary there. And I'm never going to know what it's like to be a cat. But it's certainly interesting just like paying really close attention to how he acts and just trying to trying to figure that out. And I don't know. It feels it feels really close to me. It feels like a, a way to be really bonded with him. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Adam says that he's had pets and he's had kids, and the kids are different, um, but pets are no less of a person. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I wonder kind of how. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I I have a hard time imagining that I would make a good parent. Just it's so easy to imagine all the different ways things would go wrong, but I'd probably do a better job than my mom did. <laughs> like, you you probably I don't know. It's like. And and then I feel like I feel like I've I've 
I don't know if I would do a good job, but I would probably do a better job. I mean, and my parents, there's all sorts of things that I really don't appreciate about the way they treated me, but I'm also absolutely sure that they each did a much better job than their parents did. So that's, that's certainly something positive about humanity, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know that much about, I mean, I, I know almost nothing about my dad's family because he cut them off pretty early, but like, I know enough to know why he cut them off. Hmm. It's weird. It just feels like it feels like that made him kind of blow an emotional fuse, like like it's a safety process, but that link isn't there anymore. So I don't know how he and I can connect. I mean, these days I mostly don't try. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it makes it easy to not try to connect when you don't actually respect him at all. <laughs> I think I would have I would have more respect for him if he wasn't, you know, all sorts of reasons. Anyway, this is not a rant about people in my family because I'm sure everyone's got shitheads to rant about. Yeah, so we got one person who said who recommends StreamYard and then Discord and like I mean I I'm not I'm not disputing that these things will work. It's just like I I find it exhausting to be constantly having to put my trust in platforms that I have no reason to invest any of my time or energy or resources or skill and into like I Like, I would much rather spend some time, like, fussing with something that is public than, like, just having an easy solution that I am just, like, completely buying into from some company that doesn't actually have anyone's best interest in mind. So, like, yeah, we could do Discord, whatever, but I don't, I, I'm looking for other options, like... Yeah, Discord is always out there. We could always fall out, fall back on Discord if there isn't anything good, but... Oh, pet goats. That's pretty cool. I I had a friend who grew up with pet goats, and she spoke very highly of them. Um, and then there's a question about whether Rust is harder than C or C++ uh, from somebody who wants to learn it but isn't sure. Um, I would say that that's an interesting question because... Rust, you'll probably find, is harder to get something that appears to work in than C or C++. But C and C++ are extremely hard to write robust and correct code in. It is possible, but only just barely. Like, it is extremely hard to write C or C++ code that is not full of security bugs and memory bugs. It's possible to do it. I've spent many years of my life, like trying to get as close as possible, you're never going to be perfect. There's always going to be problems and it requires a huge amount of discipline, but you can easily just make some junk that will compile and run, but won't be reliable with C and C++. Um, Rust is much more about kind of making you take the medicine up front and it's a little bit harder to get to the point where you can write Rust code that's even going to compile and do what you want. But once you get to that point, they make it much, much, much more possible to actually create code that's actually reliable. Like, whereas with C and C++, it's just like barely possible. With Rust, there are just entire categories of problems that the language itself tries to eliminate. 
And you know, of course, you can't just, you know, there are other categories of problems that the Rust compiler can't help you with, but there's a lot that it tries to do, which it's the sort of thing where the language, you know, C and C++ have been obviously insufficient for decades at this point. Like nobody uses C and C++ because it's the most effective tool to write a particular program in, in isolation. People use C and C++ because it has the connections to every other ecosystem that they need. You know, it has the binary compatibility with the libraries that they need. It can, you know, every operating system, you can write like raw C and C++ code that communicates with its native APIs. Whereas with other languages, that's more of, you know, it depends on the language, it depends on the kit that you're using. Um, with Rust, they try to eliminate some of those uh, boundaries by making it um, easier to interoperate with C and C++ code than most other systems languages. But, you know, there are still reasons people use C and C++, but I, it's, it's not usually because it's, you know, an objectively good tool. It's usually because it has some kind of existing foothold in the problem domain that you're working with. Oh, that's also a good point, that C is much simpler than Rust, and C++ is much more complicated than Rust. Yes, that's very true. Um, well, and so what I said about C being hard to write correct programs in is also true. C is an interesting language because from a language point of view, it's very simple, but the amount of complexity it exposes you to is actually very high. So in order to write good quality C code, you have to have um, a very low level understanding of a lot of the surrounding components. So if you want to write C, a C program that works reliably, you kind of have to also just understand in pretty good detail, like the operating system and libraries and threading model and memory model, and sometimes like memory allocator and concurrency model and sometimes CPU that you're operating with. And any of those things can have kind of unexpected gotchas that um, you might expect an abstraction around, but C doesn't really give you abstractions for the most part. Like it gives you just the thinnest of abstractions around memory access itself, and that's pretty much it. Like I mean, and then there's the C standard library, which I guess is technically part of the language, but it mostly just gives you access to things like files and input and output. Um, it's still very low level. And then there's some misunderstanding about concurrency in Rust. Um, somebody asked if Rust is li feature limited to one thread. I think you're thinking of Python. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but not really. Um, so, so Rust is actually, um, it's designed to be a full featured robust systems language so that anything that you would need to write you could write in Rust. Like you could write an operating system or a web browser entirely in Rust if you needed to. So it's got to support threads. You've got to have concurrency for it to be a viable language. Um, different languages that try to, so like C and C++, it's all up to you. Like if you want to run code on two processors at the same time or on two threads at the same time or in two threads concurrently, but not simultaneously. Um, if you want any of those kinds of concurrency with C and C++, you're entirely on your own. The operating system, I mean, um, the operating system provides some primitives that you can use. Um, recent versions of C++ provide some uh, wrappers around those operating system primitives. But even like earlier versions of C++ or like plain C, they don't even know about multi-threading. They don't know that you can have multiple threads. They don't know about multiple CPUs, um, which isn't, you know, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's, uh, you know, it's the case on a lot of systems that you do actually only have one CPU, embedded systems. Um, and even on systems that run multiple CPUs, those multiple CPUs are usually identical. They usually access memory in identical ways. So the language itself doesn't necessarily have to support it. But if you ever want those threads to, to, if, the, if you ever want those threads to communicate with each other, then the language could be providing you a way to do that. And if it doesn't, then it's really just forcing you to, um, to operate at a lower level and just think about the memory semantics as your inner process communication method. 
And the thing is, that's actually really complicated. If you have two threads that are trying to communicate by memory, um, it's, it's an intrinsically complicated thing to do because most of the actual tasks that you would be performing, you would have to break them down into several different memory accesses. And now you have not just a single atomic event that has stuff before and stuff after, but you have just a bunch of things that are happening. And in the middle of that, there are all these intermediate states that if you look at those states, you might not see what you're expecting. Um, you might not have a way of modeling those intermediate states in language. So like if you, um, an easy example of this is incrementing. This is, this is a common one, right? Like let's say you want two threads that are both um, incrementing a counter. Let's say you want them to both increment the same counter. So like one thread is counting, um, you know, people going in the store and one thread is counting people going out of the store or whatever. But let's say the store has two doors and you have one person going in and one person going out at the same time and they're being counted on two separate threads. Then if you are building this on top of memory, which is how CPUs work, one of those CPUs is fetching the value from memory, adding one to it and then writing it back. The other CPU is fetching the value, subtracting one, writing it back. There is no way for it to just tell the memory, like, oh, you should just subtract one from yourself. Like, the CPU has to do this in multiple steps. So you've already got this problem where there is a concurrency issue in the hardware that the language of C doesn't actually model because C just it looks like you're just incrementing, right? Um, so there, there's just this whole field of computer science, right, about how you build safe concurrency around memory. And C, C++ just makes you do all that yourself. Like it's possible, but you've got to do it all yourself. And it's really, really subtle. There's a lot of ways to do it wrong. And a lot of things you have to know about the underlying hardware to even, to even know how to do it right. And it's one of these things where if you're not doing it correctly, the penalty is there's maybe a one in a billion chance your program crashes. Or maybe the situation changes and now there's a one in 10 chance your program crashes. And maybe you don't know what triggers that change. Maybe it's like an external, you know, you can end up with these bugs that are very hard to track down because they rely on the way that these different clocks end up lining up with each other. And there are just so many different possibilities there. So C and C++, you're dealing with that whole thing. And I, I have former coworkers who, you know, they have been in the industry for decades and they will not write multi-threaded code because it's just really, really subtle. Um, at least not, not at that level where you're accessing memory directly. So, you know, different languages have different ways of adding abstractions to, to make that um, easier to reason about and possible to write code that is more robust in without like having to um, never make a mistake. So, um, you know, I, I'm not familiar with that much with Go, but Go d solves this problem by using channels. So the way that you send data from one thread to another is through like a little, a little queue that you send messages through. And then under the hood, they can optimize that in a lot of different ways. Um, it's a common primitive that you have in other systems. Like um, this isn't like the only way to do concurrency or sorry, the only way to do multi-thread communication in um, like Mac OS, but there's a built-in mechanism in Mac OS for passing messages between threads like that too. Um, you know, POSIX has a few of them <laughs> that nobody uses. Oh, Tuk Tuk. Oh, he's definitely going to want some playtime. Um, yeah, so like, I don't know. And like, so of course C and C++ gives you all the rope you want to hang yourself. So you can access memory directly. You can write all these higher level abstractions yourself. You can use libraries, whatever. People usually use a library, but then there are so many libraries to choose from and they're not necessarily going to be compatible with each other. And they all have different dependency chains that you might end up having to use multiple of. Hey, Tuk Tuk. Hey, boy, I know you're bored. What do you want? Hey! Hey, little one. Meow. Mmm, chirp, chirp. Oh, he's gonna want to chomp on all these wires. Hmm? So anyway, I guess I haven't even gotten to Rust. So, um, Rust has an interesting take on this because 
because of that thing where like Rust wants to be a fairly general purpose systems language for writing like operating systems and web browsers and whatever, they don't want to rule out um, fairly low level forms of interprocess communication. So like I think it was not really consistent with Rust's design goals to force you to use channels like message queues for everything, for example. Um, what they do with Rust, though, is they have a really good way of reasoning about um, the lifetimes and ownership of memory. So anytime you allocate some memory, either at compile time or at runtime, and you pass ownership of this memory around to different parts of the program, Rust has a very consistent system for keeping track of that, both at compile time and optionally at runtime. So by doing that, you can actually pass memory from thread to thread, for example, um, as long as you aren't trying to use it from both threads simultaneously. And so you can build a lot of useful types of communication primitives around that. Um, you can also write unsafe code in Rust and do whatever you want, but then ultimately you have to be providing a safe interface to the rest of the Rust code that you're then interacting with. So it's got this, I mean, really it's sort of like a bureaucracy. It's like a, it's just like a system for keeping memory uh, from getting used in ways that are not uh, reliable. But that same kind of system, like you could do that in C and C++, and indeed, basically anybody who has to write large quantities of C code does create a system like this. But that system is not going to be as thorough or as automatic as what you get in Rust. It's going to be like people writing comments that say, oh, you've got to allocate this, or don't forget to free this, or like, oh, this pointers turn clockwise on Tuesdays and things like that. And and you've got to read this and it's like it's like following a complicated city parking sign sometimes. It's if you miss something in the API documentation, then you can end up leaking memory or double freeing memory or creating a security vulnerability. And if you have a system that the compiler enforces, then there's a lot less room for that. <laughs> I, I'm not quite following this conversation about the uh, about Rust only being memory safe for a single thread. There's that's not actually true. Like there's a whole lot of misinformation about multi-threading out there. Like a lot of folks will tell you if you do this thing, it is definitely safe, or if you do this thing, it is never safe, or don't ever like do this, whatever. And usually understanding what you can actually do requires like understanding the particular CPU architecture that you're on. And not even just that, but like the kinds of memory accesses that um, could, or the kinds of, um, like if you have a, a, a thing in memory, like an address in memory, it probably refers to some RAM. That's what most addresses refer to. That's probably, um, you know, it's probably like main system memory that's attached to your one CPU package. And when you request it, it's gonna be loaded into the CPU cache. And then the CPU will send messages to the other bus devices if the cache um, is written to so that, you know, other caches can be expired. There's all these layers of messaging within the hardware platform to keep that consistent. Um, you've got to know the limitations of the cache consistency. You've also got to understand, like, well, if if you're passing data between components that have like different uh, like different caching guarantees, like if uh, you know if you're communicating with hardware, you might be dealing with memory that is um, you know, being directly read or written using DMA. Maybe you're like a couple levels away from that and you're writing like a network driver or something and you're not doing the DMA yourself, but you're getting these packets that um, now you've, you know, somebody's got to make sure that the CPU completely flush, flushes its cache out to those packets before the network device touches that. Um, 
And the, the amount of infrastructure that's involved for keeping caches consistent varies a lot depending on whether you're on like, you know, like a tiny microcontroller or like a bigger kind of embedded application processor or like a full-blown PC. Um, yeah, the, the systems that PCs use for cache co coherency are really complicated and I, I'd certainly need to read a lot to understand them if I was getting into that kind of, um, like that particular kind of, co co of coherency. Tugo was behind there, but I think he moved on. Yeah, I mean, a lot, like there's a lot of weeds to get into with um, with memory safety and coherency. Um, a lot of it, you know, you can kind of play it safe and build concurrency guarantees around something that is simpler, not like the most complicated thing, but you know, so like, let's say you have some caching system or some hardware that is difficult to reason about. You can, um, you can put a, uh, like some other kind of concurrency primitive around that so that you can be sure that, um, yeah, I'm having trouble coming up with a concrete example that isn't too specific. Um, But like, let's say you have a, uh, well, so here's an example. Um, yeah, that's not a good example. <laughs> we, we had, we had something kind of like that in the graphics subsystem, um, at this, on this virtual graphics card I worked on a long time ago. Um, but like because it was a virtual device, like fundamentally, that was the same like memory that the CPU was already dealing with. So like, anyway, um, like I mean, there's a lot of esoteric edge cases in the hardware world. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you're if you're not dealing with anything especially weird, you know, if you're dealing with like a PC and RAM, like RAM on the PC that's being cached, but you're dealing with hardware that knows how to, how to deal with, the how to like um, snoop the cache and like, uh, or you're dealing with like a, um, I'm struggling with describing this because I actually don't know enough about this to tell you very specifically where the boundaries are, where you definitely need to care about this or you don't, or you definitely don't need to care about that. And I feel like that's a really common problem in concurrency. It's like the process of laying out exactly where things are definitely safe and where things are maybe not safe is itself somewhat complicated and architecture dependent. Um, so like if you're, um, in most like PC environments, the things that are going to screw you up are unexpected behavior from library code or, um, oh, to go, to go. Hey, don't be chewing those. Um, or uh, memory accesses that you expect to um, to be atomic that actually aren't. So, like, I mean, this is something we would run into a lot, where like people would um, would write a value um, expecting it to be an atomic write. So, that, you know, there's no intermediate state. It's always either fully written or fully not written, and then. Um, you can use that either on its own as like a condition flag, or you can use that to guard like some other um, state. But um, Tuco, it's so hard to concentrate when I'm worried about Tuco. It's like, what is he getting into next? So like, if you if you're using like a higher level primitive, like a like a mutex or a semaphore. Like inside that, there's going to be an atomic write to memory where you need something that changes the value in RAM without there being any possibility of an intermediate state. It's always either done or not done. Oh, Tuco! Dude!
man, I was, I was dreading setting up these SDI cables because this is exactly the kind of cable Tuco likes to chew on. And I need them to bring you the video that you're seeing right now, but Tuco also loves chewing on them. And they're so long, I don't have any way of cat-proofing the whole length right now. Hey, boy, boy, you're making me so nervous under there. So, like, if you have, um, if you have some other higher-level synchronization primitive that is expecting um, this atomic memory write, and then you're actually writing to memory that is not aligned on your bus, or you're writing something that isn't RAM, like, let's say you have a library that um, is expecting a pointer to a mutex, and you want to lock the mutex and then do some stuff and then unlock the mutex, whatever. But then, like, if you give it a pointer to some memory which is not aligned for some reason, you know, like your allocator is broken, or you, um, you give it a pointer that's in, like, some weird peripheral DMA region or something, then, like, you know, it might have different guarantees. These are all kind of esoteric, though. Like, usually what happens is um, people assume that something is going to be atomic when it's actually not the right width. So people will try to do an atomic 64-bit write on a 32-bit processor, or they'll try to do an atomic 8-bit write or something, and, which actually should be fine. But um, Actually, I don't know that that's guaranteed. That's actually one of those things that people probably do a lot and it probably works in practice, but I think that technically the Intel manual says you shouldn't. Like, I think that you don't actually get guarantees that 8-bit writes are atomic. Um, but I'd have to go check the manual. So these are the kinds of things that you have to think about if you're writing low-level concurrent code in C and C++, where most other languages try to just keep you from having to deal with this. Tuco! Dude. Dude, what is it about SDI cables? Dude. No, don't, honey. Little guy. Wah. Oh, it might be time to wrap up this stream and play with Tuco. I guess I've been going for a few hours at this point, huh? Didn't think this would be a long stream. Ha 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 ha. Uh, that doesn't, I don't think, I don't agree with that. <laughs> There's a comment on uh, Twitch that um, what they like about C and C++ is that it stands alone and that other languages feel more like a platform um, and dependencies are BS is the quote here. Yeah, that I I disagree with that entirely. Um, I think you see that a lot where people, like I I think I felt like that at one point. Like I used to think that C and C plus plus were, um, were kind of simpler in some way because the uh, you know there isn't like a library ecosystem to speak of and the libraries that you do get are often bundled with the operating system in some way. Um, but it's, I mean, all of that is, I think, um, like none of that is intrinsic to the language. It's because of how it's packaged and it's because of the limitations in the packaging environment. Like, And you see people trying to um, trying to get out of that rut with C and C++, like Boost. Like that's entirely what Boost is about. And a lot of people don't like Boost because Boost kind of goes against the grain of of that minimalism. But like um, that thing that looks like minimalism in C and C++, I am skeptical that that's actually minimalism, and I don't think it's helpful. Hey, Tuco, Tuco. Like I think a lot of it is just due to how. Basically, everything that's built into Unix-like operating systems at this point feels invisible to some people, and you don't really think of it as a platform, but it's extremely hard to get away from as a platform. Mm. 
you can certainly use C and C++ without any of the library infrastructure, but like you can say that of a lot of languages. Like you could use Python without the standard library. It's not a lot of fun, but you can certainly do it. Oh, that's a good suggestion. Uh, somebody mentions uh, Jitsi as a um, video conferencing thing for the call-in shows. That's true. I've, I've used that like once, and then I forgot about it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Thank you. That might be the option then. Yeah, I think, I think either something like Jitsi or Zoom. Like, if it's open source, that's definitely a plus, though, because I... Like I said, there's so many options now. Like, I feel like there there's like a dozen different services we could use, but it just feels so draining to invest in something that I have no reason to like. So, something that is at least like open source or has some kind of good public goal to it would be nice. And and then like the um, the gameriness of Discord is a pretty big turnoff, and also just the lack of accessibility features. Oh, Tuco, Tuco, don't do that. I'm going to close the door. Hey, Tuco, I'll come play with you in a minute, okay? Gosh. Yeah, Tuco is a huge handful, but, like, I could never live without him. I mean, you know, he's not going to live forever, and that's going to be sad. But I... He's just so important to me, and he's... I don't know, like, he's part of my family. Like, there's there's nothing really more to it. He's, And he's basically the best family I've got right now. So, I mean, like, he's a handful, but it's completely worth it. And I don't, I don't understand people who can just be like, oh, why do you bother with the cat? Like, it's... I mean, that's what life is about, right? Like, like what's the point of living if you don't have a cat to meow at you? Yeah, no, that's really great. Um, I mean, he is, a, he is a handful, and he certainly gets on my nerves sometimes, but look at this. I shut the door. There's a door, and he's on the other side of it now. <laughs> and, I mean, he's not extremely happy about that. I'm sure he'd rather be playing with me, but he's got a lot of toys in there and plenty of food, and he's got a good view, so... And he isn't complaining yet. <laughs> Gosh, it'd be cool to have a call-in show at a regular time. That would be neat. Well, I'll have to do some experimentation and see what works well, but I'll try to have that set up for the next stream. Because that would be pretty great. Oh, interesting. Um, another interesting point from Adam that compilers are working really hard with CPU manufacturers on the thread safety, and the latest uh, CppCon had some talks about that. Yeah, that is a good point. If you're, I mean, that is true even outside of concurrency land. Like in general, compilers and CPUs are like that. Like the people writing the compilers know the CPUs better than anyone else, other than maybe the folks who test the CPUs. Yeah, okay, that's that's a good thing to, to keep note on. Yeah, a lot of times the way the CPUs actually implement um, thread safety guarantees does not match how they say they implement it, and they're going to be errata. According to Adam here in chat, um, AMD is kind of close, x86 has some errata that's worth taking note on, and then ARM is almost completely on spec. I mean, ARM has had a much better... Uh, They've had much more reason to be on spec than x86, really. It's good to know that they are.
it's also worth distinguishing, I think, between like symmetric multiprocessing and asymmetric multiprocessing. It's like usually what we're talking about here is just a big pile of CPUs that are all the same and can all run the same code. Um, but yeah, it, there's also a lot of cool opportunities for um, concurrency at the hardware level with specialized processors or with just like different kinds of units that are all stuck together doing similar things. Um, if you want to be a connoisseur of weird architectures, it's also worth looking at whatever information you can get your hands on about GPUs because they do some interesting... Um, they, I mean, I, I, I'm not even up to date on like the latest NVIDIA architectures, but I feel like every time I read a paper about what they're doing, there's, um, there's just something I haven't seen before. Hmm. All right, well, I think I'm gonna wrap this up for tonight. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out. Um, let me know what you think. I'll try to keep everyone uh, in the loop about what's going on, but I'm also just gonna try to, um, well, I guess <laughs> in conclusion, there are several things going on. Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's, there's always a lot, but um, like I need to find a focus for the actual project output, which I mean, is going to involve some amount of just trying to get my own thoughts more sorted out. But I feel like a lot of the roadblock right now is I need to understand my audience and the people around me a bit better. And so, yeah, maybe maybe just doing more chat shows will help with that, um, especially if it can be more bidirectional. Because, yeah, call-in shows do seem like maybe the right format for now. Um, and now that I have doors and a quiet room it's pretty great like i'm still i still kind of can't get over can't get over how much quieter this room is than my previous um studio and it's not that quiet even it's just the previous studio was full of fan noise so it's nice having that um having those elsewhere all right well thanks so much thanks to everybody who uh supports the channel on patreon i i know it's been a bit weird lately and I feel pretty like anxious about like I want to be able to do something that all of my supporters like so if, if you're out there supporting me I, I want to tell you both how much I appreciate you but also how much I um like I guess I just I just want to also understand you a little bit better <laughs> so um yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just I just need to understand like who my peeps are. Like I've been saying a lot, and so if you if you want to say hi, I'll try to say hi. But please please be gentle because I also have a lot of social anxiety, and so if you write like too much at once, I I might have a hard time responding. Um, but yeah, if you just say hi, that'd be awesome. All right, see you next time. Happy hacking. <laughs>